arts and sciences, education, social work, and diplomacy. Its fine arts and music programs have produced outstanding graduates through a holistic education that treasures heritage as well as excellence. PWU has pioneered in fields such as food science, nutrition and dietetics, medical technology, pharmacy, and nursing. PWU continues to play an essential role in producing graduates who possess the skills that make them competitive in the country and anywhere in the world. A pleasant day to all and to the rest of the world. Welcome to the Philippine Women's University Doctor of Philosophy in Nursing. Today is the 20th day of February 2021, live at Doha, Qatar. This is Nursing Today, Transitions and Trends. My name is Peach Dillis Loyal, and I will be your today's moderator. Well, the overall goal of this activity, entitled Nursing Today, is to interactively discuss relevant issues that affect nurses and, of course, their multifaceted practice, considering the dynamic, often disruptive, and highly globalized world. Well, today's webinar, of course, is led and hosted by the relentless and vibrant students of Doctor of Philosophy in Nursing, in Qatar and Kuwait, in coordination, of course, with our Graduate School of Nursing, ICT, and the Multimedia Department. Participants, for you to receive your e-certificates for this webinar, please make sure to answer the evaluation that you will receive at the end of this session. To formally begin, I would like to invite you all to do an open video invocation to be followed by the singing of the Philippine national anthem.
in order to ensure smooth flow of the program and for us to meet the learning objectives of this activity, I just would like to remind you of the following statements. For those who are in the Philippine Women's University Facebook live streaming, please type your complete name and your questions in the comment section as our facilitators are readily available to answer your queries. Sit down, I encourage you to do that, in a quiet environment where you are most relaxed and stop multitasking as much as possible. If required, you may use your ear headphones or earphones, okay? The evaluation link shall be posted in the Philippine Women's University FB live streaming in three ways. Number one, through participants' email that will be sent to you later on. Second, it will be shown on the screen so you can scan it, or third, it will be shown in the comment section with the QR code and the link. Okay, so sit back, relax, and enjoy learning. Okay, so at this point, allow us to welcome the guests from around the world and send our grace as we welcome all of you. Allow me to introduce the head nurse of Hazim Mubarak General Hospital, my colleague, and as well as the chairman of the organizing committee. Let's call in Mr. Arce V. Amparo. Distinguished guest, Mr. Marco Alfredo Benitez, University President, Dr. Felina C. Yang, Chancellor and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Minerva Diala, Dean's School of Nursing, our honorable guest speakers, Dr. Erlinda Castro Palaganas, Dr. Teresita Barcelo, Ms. Dina Snorman, and Dr. Rodolfo Borromeo. Ladies and gentlemen, a blissful afternoon to everyone. It is my privilege and pleasure to welcome all of you to this virtual affair. We are delighted to have you in today's webinar. Current trends and issues in nursing that affect nurses in today are the seminar's points of focus. How do nurses survive? and tribe not only in the age of globalization, but also in the age of pandemic. What rules in the global nursing practice must be explored? Is blended learning effective in nursing education? In this challenging time, do nurses still find meaning and joy in the everything they do? We aim to find the answers to these questions through the lively exchange we will be having today. We are fortunate to have four renowned speakers in the field of nursing whose expertise and experiences are truly remarkable. Their competencies, training, and exposure to the field are rich sources of knowledge and inspiration. Prepare yourself to be challenged, excited, and inspired. Once again, I welcome you all to the Nursing Today Transitions and Trends. Let us all remember, nurses are the heart of healthcare because nursing is a work of heart. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Amparo, for welcoming our participants. I know you're all excited with this webinar, but before anything else, allow me to call someone who in one way or another will spread positivity amidst the COVID-19 and other issues that we are going through. To give an inspirational message, it is my privilege to hand you over the Chancellor and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs Philippine Women's University. Let me welcome Dr. Felina C. Young. Uh, thank you very much to Dr. Minerva de Alla, Dean of the College of Nursing, to the organizers of this important webinar, our esteemed guests in the field of nursing, our hardworking faculty, Dear students in Qatar, Kuwait, and in the Philippines, our guests, a pleasant good afternoon. I've always believed that the inclusion of the course on issues, trends, and challenges in nursing has always been a timely and relevant step in providing our PhD students with a holistic and informative perspective on how to look at the nursing profession. Needless to say, this outlook is germane to the nursing professionals today. 
First is the emphasis on undertaking nursing researches. The field of nursing research is vast in scope, colorful in content knowledge, and meaningful in outcomes. Healthcare learnings in terms of facts, concepts, theories, principles, and practices are varied and multifaceted. Analyzing, integrating, and translating these research evidences to clinical perspective and practice can benefit those needing attention and cure in providing distinct and individualized patient care. Secondly is the practicality of shifting the nursing education to blended learning. As what we are experiencing today due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the benefits of blended learning for nursing professionals in enhancing their professional growth and development cannot be overstated. Nurses are able to fittingly and accessibly continue the enrichment of their professional qualifications, deep knowledge, and career opportunities now and for the future. In fact, the blended learning approach is fitting and advantageous to any nursing professional. And we at PWU is an exponent of the blended learning approach. Thirdly is the opportunity to explore the new and expanded roles of the nursing practice in the current global landscape. As a result of emerging global health issues, we now see a redefinition of the nursing profession structure and the varied but specific and unique roles that nurses will take today. After all, the world is dynamic and the reality of change is a certainty. And lastly, is the thrust of creating a culture of resilience in the healthcare workplace. Resilience in you as nurses and resilience in patients. In any either way, I want to remind you that you nurses play a very significant role in the lives of the ordinary individual seeking for health care. We honestly depend on each one of you because you help us heal and get better. You give us hope in times of sickness and above all, you bring about that much needed difference. So in that light, I'd like to thank you and welcome each one of you in this noteworthy seminar prepared by our PhD students headed by Mr. Arce Amparo and all the organizers. We are very proud of this particular informative and uh, intellectual seminar. We thank you you know, for this particular project and welcome to everybody. A pleasant good afternoon. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Felina C. Young, for that inspiring message. I believe that what you have said, as what I have uh, catched up, is that nurses play a significant role in the lives of ordinary individuals, and we will treasure that one. It was a pleasure to have you with us, and I believe that our audience here have been inspired by your speech. Ladies and gentlemen, still you are watching Nursing Today, Transitions and Trends. And of course, to know more about this webinar, let us watch this video. Today's webinar will tackle four major nursing areas, research, education, nursing practice, and administration. Change is constant. But the question is, are we ready for that? What is the role and importance of nursing research during this time? Will evidence-based research studies lead us back to the old lifestyle? 
or compel us to adapt to the new normal? How does nursing education delivery keep up with blended learning, yet, still ensuring quality education? Nursing practice is always evolving, but have we considered the ethical grounds in developing guidelines and policies, in order to provide quality care? Do nurse administrators develop methods, to address challenges in the clinical setting, and considering the welfare of nurses at the same time? We hope, that this webinar will enlighten everyone. As we move forward, to a safer nursing practice, join us, as we unravel the current trends in nursing, and collect the pearls, of learning as we begin this webinar. Let's begin. This webinar activity focuses on the current trends and issues in the nursing profession. To ensure continuous flow of activity, your questions shall be entertained at the end of each speaker. However, feel free to drop your questions or clarifications by using the comment section in the Philippine Women's University Facebook Live streaming. So everyone buckle up and stay tuned as we will now proceed to our first speaker, who will discuss to us about the current trends and challenges in nursing research and evidence-based practice. And of course, to formally welcome our first resource speaker, allow me to call in Ms. Nasrin Ahmed Rafat Mohammed, the nurse educator, Pediatric Emergency Center, Hamad General Hospital, and the chairman of the Scientific Planning Committee. Research is an indispensable element that shapes every profession and discipline, and employing evidence-based research into practice has become a core competence that all nurses must have. In light of the major changes underway worldwide, nursing research trends must be adapted to meet new global challenges that confront our profession. I am very sure that we have the best person to explore a highly relevant topic to start today's virtual event. It is an honor to introduce our first speaker. Her well-decorated career exemplifies passion and with innumerable high-impact contributions to the Philippine nursing practice, research, and beyond. Dr. Erlene Da Castro Palaganas is a professor and scientist at the University of the Philippines, Baguio, with a master's in public health from the University of Philippines, Manila, and completed her PhD in nursing from the University of Sydney, Australia. She authored a number of books, research and publications, and international collaborative researches in the field of nonprofit sector management and health services. Her work is instrumental in planning and delivery of the Department of Health programs guided the delivery of services in the national and regional levels and helped in curriculum enhancement and community empowerment. Dr. Palaganas is the editor-in-chief of the Philippine Journal of Nursing since 2008 and became president of the Philippine Nursing Research Society from 2008 to 2016 and the PNA national president in the year 2019. Our speaker is also a member of the Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society of Nursing and the only nurse member of the Philippine Association of Medical Journal Editors and the Asia Pacific Association of Medical Editors. For all this, her years of outstanding dedication and service was recognized through various awards and merits. To mention a few, being awarded a CMO Asia's Excellence Awards in Education and nominee for the National Research for the Anastasia Hiron Tupas Award. Indeed, she has a research journey that knows no destination but excellence, honor, and relevance. Let me present to you all to give us a talk on trends and challenges in nursing research and evidence-based practice, the nurse educator, the researcher, the social development worker and human rights advocate, Dr. Erlinda Castro Palaganas. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Nashreen, for that wonderful um, present uh, introduction. I appreciate it. And congratulations, everyone, for 
uh, this uh, uh, webinar or yeah, the webinar this afternoon. In, I think it is uh, very timely. And yes, I appreciate you inviting me and I'm honored to be in this presentation this afternoon. So again, I go back, share. So do you see my presentation? Do you see my presentation? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, but I don't see my presentation. <laughs> okay, this is it. All right. So once again, good afternoon. And uh, Dr. Yang, the um, uh, Vice President for Academic Affairs of PWU, magandang hapon po. And everyone, everyone who is in this um, webinar, magandang hapon po. So again, it's a pleasure to talk about trends and challenges in nursing research and evidence-based practice. And for those who would like to, who would love, uh, who would have questions and will not have the opportunity to be answered this afternoon, you can just email me. These are my details. I have given a copy of this presentation to Nashreen. And I'd like to declare this afternoon that I don't have any conflict of interest. I have nothing to declare. This is purely for uh, learning purposes. And uh, should I be, uh, and should there be any examples that I will be giving, I have no intention to hurt anyone. I have no intention to blame or downgrade anyone. And uh, Nashreen me uh, mentioned that I'm a member and an officer of the Philippine Association of Medical Journal Editors and the Asia Pacific Association of Medical Editors. And of course, such membership is recognized and supported by the Philippine Nurses Association, I being the editor-in-chief of the uh, Philippine Journal of Nursing. So uh, whatever images that I have used in this presentation are from my personal files and from Google, so there are no copyright infringement intended. So I'd like to mention that the presentation of uh, my, the aims of this presentation came from you. And so I diligently oblige with the three aims that you have given me. And these are discuss the importance of integration of evidence-based knowledge into practice and to um, explore uh, trends and challenges in nursing research. And third is to discuss the national unified health research agenda or what we call the NURA. So I will therefore look at the presentation according to the aim. So this, the flow will be as we answer these three aims that you have provided me. So basically uh, what you want me to do or the, the theme or the message that this presentation will provide uh, or will echo is transforming care and lives in the context of research. So I guess that's the, um, the theme that would, uh, that is, uh, that would, you know, uh, stitch what I'm going to say the whole afternoon. So it's basically towards sustaining quality, quality for what? Quality for improving, of course, patient outcomes, quality patient out outcomes. And how do we do this is through research and what we are doing what you are doing what you have planned basically is continuing continuing the efforts of the past decades wherein uh, we have been there had been an increasing emphasis on ensuring that decisions made in one's practice are based on the best available evidence and that this evidence based attempts to bridge the gap between research and practice in various workplace settings, whether it's in the hospital, in the academe, in the community, or wherever we find the nurse giving um, or providing care to patients. So today, my dear friends um, or my dear colleagues in the nursing profession, we know that uh, even in the early 70s, in the 80s, this, this, this uh, evidence-based practice has already been uh, being pushed, not being pushed until what we have now. Now we have a global market, we have the ASEAN integration, and so all of these have come to what we call uh, research 
transformation. Um, today, we see more, more than ever, not today, we see how important research is in our practice. And uh, you know that, you know, being PhD students. And such, such a um, acknowledgement will have to look into research you know, as a fundamental, fundamental tool in evidence-based practice. And when we say research is a fundamental tool in evidence-based practice, it means that we need to review, we need to commit ourselves in the three foci of higher education institutions. And that's why you are here. That's why you have, uh, you know, you have planned for this webinar because it is a commitment it's a commitment to teach uh, in teaching you know knowledge dissemination and uh, we are committed to extension work that's knowledge application and we are committed to research and that's knowledge generation and so therefore if you try to look at it it's basically knowledge knowledge dissemination knowledge application knowledge generation and that's what what it is being in the PhD program is all about. Remember that, my dear colleagues. So if research is, uh, is or as a fundamental tool in evidence-based practice means sustaining quality research towards a robust academic education and clinical practice. So that means to say there is a need for evidence. And when we say evidence, evidence is always equal or equals to research evidence equals research nothing more nothing less okay and uh, we see now a you know a proliferation so since the 70s 80s and up to this time we see a lot of proliferation of resources on evidence on evidence base you have journals you have books and researches have been you know have been proliferating in line with evidence based practice and so we know that we are there uh, maybe we have not gotten there yet, but we are towards that journey. So evidence-based practice, I'd like to uh, take on from what Dr. Daiwai Olson mentioned in his um, uh, presentation in 2012 when he came to the Philippines to talk about evidence-based practice. We talk about uh, the process of disseminating and using, so disseminating and using research-generated information to make an impact on or change in existing health care practices okay so what are these practices it could be in hospital it could be in our way of teaching it could be in academe so that's evidence-based practice so therefore it means it is a shift a shift in the culture of health care provision away from basing our decisions on opinion, on past practice, and proceeded towards making more use of science, research, and evidence to guide clinical decision making. Therefore, again, evidence-based nursing means it is a process by which nurses make clinical decisions using the best available research evidence. Their clinical expertise and patient preferences. So if you try to look at this par uh, paradigm or conceptual framework of, uh, of evidence-based practice, it tells you of the three crucial elements, research evidence and evidence-based theories, the clinical expertise, meaning to say um, the evidence from one's practice, no? whoever is that clinical practitioner or academ academician for that matter. And of course, the third one is patient preferences and values. Meaning to say that even if there is that evidence, research evidence, uh, based on your expertise, but patient preference is not there, meaning to say the patient does not agree with that piece of evidence, then it is something that we have to uh, work on it. And so it is also something whereby our clinical decision making will have to be uh, hinged. So these are the three crucial elements of our decision making towards quality patient outcomes. And um, this is basically what we want in an evidence-based practice. And in the um, paradigm, or the same paradigm, evidence-based practice paradigm of nurse or doctor, Patra Porn, uh, Tumpo, um, 
Tung Phuong Kong. Uh, she is a, a nurse practitioner from Thailand, from Chiang Mai, uh, Chiang Mai University. Um, the same thing. She did. She had three steering wheels of evidence-based practice, and to her, the biggest steering wheel, wheel is the research evidence ba uh, base that is available. And to her, uh, the same thing. The three, the three elements where you base your decision making towards your uh, quality patient outcome. So you can put such a framework in, um, in in various ways. And I will be sharing with you another uh, framework that was um, that was done by a hospital based in Daman. So going back to our first question, uh, our first. Um, uh aim which is why evidence-based practice now why do why why the heck did you um come up with this um with this webinar well um well according to various literatures we have we have to look at evidence-based practice because in the world there are many cultures there are many ways of doing things so our practice would vary okay to the spiraling cost also of healthcare in developed and developing world has you know uh, we've seen we've seen how um, care has the healthcare has really gone the cost has gone really high and that patients are not being given treatments based on the best available evidence. According to Ron Simon's study in 2012, up to 43% of patients do not receive the recommended care, and 30% receive care that is unnecessary and sometimes potentially harmful, according to Shusters et al. in 1998. And according to Bokan in 2004, compliance with evidence varies approximately 11 to 82%. My God, that's very uh, varied no? in terms of complying with uh, uh, compliance in terms of patient care. Also, traditional practices, according to Thiel and Gosh in 2008, much of nursing care is based on centuries old wisdom and experiences across generations by words of mouth and classic textbooks. Imagine 75, 72.5% or 73% of registered nurses consulted colleagues and peers rather than consulting journals and books. So, you know, it's word by, uh, uh, words uh, of mouth and class, um, and you know, and not really going to where the evidence is. And only 24% of registered nurses are using health databases to base their decision making such as SINAP. So, it's time to work smart, not just work hard, according to um, uh, Dr. Patra Morn, and, he sa and she says that uh, this is where evidence-based practice comes in. So evidence-based practice ensures effective, out ensures effective outcomes, facilitates sound decision-making, minimize risk of any intervention to ensure that benefits outweigh the harm, and it saves time, it saves energy, and it saves cost. So take this as an exemplar, according to Dr. Uh, Prataporn. Uh, the problem is high relapse rate, and patients stop taking medications once they uh, are discharged. So the evidences show that if you have a medication enhancement program, and if you do telephone visit once they get discharged, then the patient outcomes would be more medication adherence, low relapse rate, and high quality of life. And so therefore, that is evidence. So that the evidence is looking at doing telephone visit and medication enhancement program. And since the evidence is there, then this is something that we can base our decisions or adopting our programs in our institution. So instead of being you know this kind of nurse doing all that you can then you can have more quality time with your patients because of the evidence of doing your decision uh, decision making based on uh, evidences that exist but the question is what is the state of readiness for evidence based among nurses okay so there is an integrative review that states or these are the findings of Sounders uh, et al. in 2016. 
Majority of nurses never use research findings to inform their practice, never research electronic databases such as Sinol, Medline, or Cochrane, although they had access to them. And they rated the research findings from research clinical trial uh, from research clinical trials and other quantitative researches as the least important sources of information when it should be the other way around. So now it's time to ask ourselves: How ready are we with uh, evidence-based practice? So these are the questions that let us uh, that we can ask ourselves now. In terms of the practice of EBP, how often have you critically appraised against set criteria any literature you have discovered? So if you, I know your PhD students, you've read a lot of literature, but how often have you critically appraised such literature and put it side by side with your practice? Have you done it? Two, in terms of knowledge and skills associated with EBP, how are your research skills? How are your information and technology skills? Just like me earlier, I had difficulty trying to get in, you know, but I didn't stop until I learned it, you know, uh, trying to share the screen. So these are part of the, of the skills that we, uh, we have to do. Transform required data into research questions. Okay, and in terms of knowledge skills associated with EBP still, in terms of our competency in finding the practice gap in our professional framework do we see do we do we identify the gaps in the way we do things competency in evaluating the evidence base according to the set criteria how uh, um, how well how competent are we in evaluating the things that we do well according to Lee Jong Wook uh, then the WHO director, the World Health Organization Director General in 2005, he says that we really, um, uh, such situation really reflects the lack of using evidence to inform decision making at the point of care due to many limitations. So action without knowledge is wasted efforts. Knowledge without action is a wasted resource. And so this is the reason why we are all here today. And this is also the importance of producing evidence. And when we say producing evidence, this is towards publication. All right. So when you do research, because we already said that research is the fundamental tool in evidence-based practice, then this is where I'd like to focus my presentations of the trends and challenges in nursing research. But I'd like to start with asking the question, what is your role in research? I think this is very important because, you know, uh, we need to recognize what our role is in research. And according to Burns and Grove, if you are affixing a BSN after your name, then uh, BSNRN, that means to say your role is to critic research findings for use in practice. Use research findings in your practice. So that's fundamental, BSN, Bachelor of Science in Nursing. You critic and you use research findings. You use it, you know, for the, uh, your decision making. Now, if you are a Master of Science or Master of Arts in Nursing, then you must be doing collaborative research projects and you must provide clinical expertise for research. So I disagree with faculty members who have masters, uh, uh, have masters of, of science in nursing or master of arts in nursing and they say, I do not want to be an advisor. I do not want to take up research. I do not want to follow up students or be an advisor in research. If you say that, remove your BMSN or MAN after your name because it is one of your role in research. PhD, you, you try to append the PhD after your name. There are a few months from, maybe a year from here, you are appending PhD after your name. Always remember this day, always remember this moment. Uh, if you put PhD, it means you have the role to develop knowledge through research and theory development and thus conduct funded independent research projects. You, only, you go beyond your dissertation. 
do not stop at your dissertation. You have to conduct funded independent research. And if you move on to your postdoc, you have to develop and coordinate funded research programs. Okay, so um, usually a lot of the trends, a lot of the challenges in nursing research stems from these four pillars. Okay, so um, the philosophy that we embrace, the trustworthiness and rigor of our data, the validity and reliability of our data, and the current practice of reflexivity. And I'd like to revolve uh, a, a lot of my discussions in this. So in terms of philosophy, I always say, and I love this quote from uh, Shun Ryu Suzuki in the, found in Manhal. It's a Zen quote that says, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the expert's mind, there are very few. So what I mean to say here is, no matter how old we are now, how aged we are, how good we are in research, we always adopt a beginner's mind. We don't say we are experts because when we say we are experts, then there are very few possibilities that comes to form. So now, um, again, I would like to reiterate, we need to do research because, you know, as nurses, as nurse practitioners, we are always accountable to society. We are accountable to provide high quality, ethical, acceptable services, as, I, as mentioned by Dr. Putaporn earlier. Services provide, um, that, that the services that we provide must be constantly evaluated and improved on the basis of new and refined research knowledge. And nurse practitioners need to use research findings to determine the best way to deliver services. So again, it all boils down to quality services. But I, um, I wanted to take off this slide earlier, but I, I put it back because I wanted to show that in our readiness to do evidence-based practice, uh, this systematic review reveals that, no, by um, Dobbins and et al, reveals that the, 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 uh, the reason why evidence-based practice is not really done is not because of individual characteristics, because in the, um, individual characteristics attributed to 1% to 3% only, while organizational factors attributed 80 to 90% no, in research utilization. So meaning to say the organization, uh, the organization's environment, uh, environmental factors 5 to 10%. So most of the reasons why we are not able to do evidence-based practice is because of organizational factors. Funding, readiness, uh, resources provided by the organization, all of this. So let us stop blaming the nurse not wanting to do evidence-based because a systematic review has already mentioned that it's more of the organizational factors. And this is where I was telling you earlier, I want you to read this article, if you haven't read it, by Rim Magadmi et al. It's uh, from the mom, no? Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. When they came up with their own uh, framework of an evidence-based practice that they utilize in their hospital, so all of this is the same, no? quality outcomes, clinical excellence, cost effectiveness, empowerment, critical thinking, professional growth, and the three um, essential elements. And of course, you have to do the nursing process here. But what strikes me here is um, looking now at the readiness of doing EBP and this particular model is saying that you know you need leadership you need an EBP and research council you need external factors to be able to do this leadership looks at mentorship clinical inquiry enthusiasm reflective practice a just culture EBP research looking at EBP and research utilization you must have an EBP web pages EBP champion and journal club in your organization and external factors, accreditation, quality measures, standards, and guidelines. You see, so it's not enough to look at this, but you see, you need to see how it is in your respective organization. So um, I am very appreciative of this uh, framework from uh, Rim Magadmi et al. So I think I have mentioned this, let us always have a beginner's mind, we always listen, 
uh, we look at what is going on in our environment. I think one of the, uh, someone who mentioned earlier in the opening of the program that what is it, what, what, what should make us relevant, should, what should we answer? No, we, we, we can only do this when we hold a beginner's mind, when we listen with a third ear and one without any noise to hear experience, especially, especially now with COVID-19. One of the challenges in nursing research today is how to establish trustworthiness and rigor, especially with qualitative research and the validity and reliability when it comes to quantitative research. Um, sometimes it's very heartbreaking when I get uh, materials for the Philippine Journal of Nursing, but you see the uh, the research procedures are not acceptable and appropriate. The statistical measurements are not appropriate, and so you have uh, you have to turn them down. And it's such to me such a waste of um, resources. So these are needed. No, uh, this um, we need to focus on the trustworthiness and rigor, the validity and reliability of our um, data or our, res our research process. And we should always bear in mind, uh, I, I love this GUBAS, mo uh, GUBAS model because it gives us the four criteria to always look at, whether it's qualitative or quantitative approach. We always look at the truth value, the applicability, the consistency, and the neutrality of uh, the research vis-a-vis uh, -vis, no? qualitative and quantitative approach. So truth value is credibility and quality, internal validity and quantity. Applicability is transferability in quality, external validity or generalizability in quantity. Consistency is dependability in quality, reliability in quantity, and in terms of neutrality, conformability in quality and objectivity in uh, quantitative research. So if we try to look at it, the challenges in nursing research is that the gaps in this are still uh, very much wanting to be addressed. So, uh, my dear colleagues, uh, one of the challenges that we have to face is basically uh, research findings. Now, they have to be communicated for professional reasons. The delivery of services should be evidence-based as much as possible to be involved in generation and in generating evidences. Always remember, my dear colleagues, it is an ethical and considered a scientific misconduct when one does not publish one's research output. So your dissertations must be, must be published. So the question is, would you want to publish or perish? Would you like to publish for money incentives? Would you like to publish for promotions or publish for EBP? Of course, we have to publish for evidence-based practice. We must publish for professional reasons, not just for vanity. We need to share the evidences that we have produced. So you, you communicate your findings through research colloquium, through uh, presentations in professional conferences, and publications through journals. But I have something here, beware of pre predatory publishers. And I'll, I'll try to look at, what, uh, at this as one of the challenges earlier. So these are some examples of researches that have been conducted by faculty members of UP College of Nursing and by colleagues based in uh, Nevada. Uh, 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 Dr. Serafica, who is a Filipino nurse based in uh, Nevada and one of uh, his colleagues. Okay, uh, some other um, articles that you find in the Philippine Journal of Nursing. So my dear colleagues, what I would like to tell you is the past, the current, and future givens in research must remain. Genuine interest, hard work, no? rigor and trustworthiness, and nurturing environment for research. You know, it's very difficult to do research if the environment is very hostile. No? We need good leaders to push us to do research. We need resources. We need policies. Ethical practice must always be there. Reflexivity in one's practice. Think, how do we do research? How The humility and openness of researchers to self critic and be critic by other people. The passion for research must be there. No, that but in the Passion should always be there, or else 
you know, it will be a difficult task to do. Publication in refereed journals and ethics of publication should also be there. And therefore, since those are givens, quality of reporting is very important. Quality of reporting is very important. And the type of articles that you write, no? It's not just research articles. You can have special articles. You can have secondary or review articles. You know, there are so many things to write. But I enjoin you to write products of your PhD um, journey. Right, reflexivities. Nurse, uh, Philippine Journal of Nursing has nurses' voice from the field. It does not have to be a research article. It can be about your journey. It could be about your work in uh, in Doha. It could be your work in you know in Kuwait, uh, wherever you are in um, the part of these parts of the world. We are waiting for these kinds of articles. So just give us a good manuscript a good article that is publishable, that is simple and clear, that you can communicate um, clearly to your audience. Because the stepping into the scholarly stream means we want the editors are looking for something new, something exciting, something important, something original and relevant. While your peer reviewers would want you to write this, well, no, well written, ex excellent literature review, excellent up to date methodology, significant contribution to the literature, and something that is concise. Okay, so my dear colleagues, you need to publish. You need to publish if you want to contribute to evidence based practice. We need the evidences from your studies. Okay. Um, it's not publish or perish. It is publish, not perish. I don't like it when they say, if you don't publish, you will perish. You will get out of this academy. You will get out of this university. The right thing to say is you have to publish so that you will not perish and you contribute to a uh, evidence-based practice. But sometimes this publication has turned into a nightmare. Now, why has it turned into a nightmare? Because a lot of uh, nurses have published into uh, what you call this predatory journal. So I want you to avoid that. We want you to publish in good journals. So there are guidelines and best practices to uh, publication. So this you will have to follow. Now, one of the trends, okay, I'm um, almost towards the end of my time, but I want you that there are authorship issues. If you want to publish and you want to be an author, you have to follow these guidelines. There are four. This is one of the challenges today. Uh, it's being violated. No? One, there, there are four criteria to be an author. One, you must have a substantial contribution to the concept or design of the work or acquisition, analysis, or interpretation of data for the work. And you are part of drafting the work or rev revising it critically for important intellectual content. And you must give a final approval for the version to be published. And you must agree to be accountable for all the aspects of the work. Without one of these, then you cannot be an author and you will just have to be acknowledged. So please, authorship implies public responsibility and accountability. So you have to, uh, you have to abide with the four, uh, four criteria. So we have many issues in authorships. There are many authors who uh, adhere to gift authorship, boss authorship, guest or honorary authorship, pressured authorship or theft ninanakaw they 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 they, um, they uh, uh, steal the ideas of others so before the original uh, author can publish it has already been published by another one these are not these are the kinds of authors that we do not want okay and if you have uh, if you have submitted your your article to a journal, you avoid simultaneous submission, you avoid image modification, you avoid selective publication, and try to avoid also salami publication if it need be. But if not, then you can uh, you can justify. Okay. So 
uh, we need to reduce this incidence by you know having a culture of ethical authorship so again as i've mentioned earlier there's a challenge turned night nightmare when you publish in predatory journals avoid this you go to this website you try to find out before you submit is this journal a predatory journal so um there, these are many uh, websites that you can go to to check on whether uh, you are submitting to a predatory journal. Try to read this, authors and readers beware of the dark side of open access, making good choices about publishing in the journal jungle because there are just so many journals. And lately, hundreds of predatory journals are already indexed on leading scholarly databases. So even Scopus has stopped adding content because of this um, challenge. And so, who publishes in predatory journals? My dear uh, colleagues, they are young and experienced researchers from developing countries. So please don't uh, fall prey to this. And there is another article here um, that has um, looked at predatory journals and has done comparative analysis from different countries. Uh, in this article, Indonesia is number one who so comes to predatory journals. Philippines is number 13. So be cautious, be cautious of your um, choosing the journals. I have one here, please read this. Um, it was published in uh, 2018. Uh, constipation among nursing students. Very obvious that it is in a predatory journal. It was uh, it was accepted November 14. It it was published November 18. So four days. That means to say there was no peer review. So please be a researcher, be an author that would publish because you want change. You want to be a tool for contributing to quality patient care, okay? Do not be gullible and just go on and publish. Choose also the journal where you publish. So scholarly publishing is definitely a long distance run. So towards the end of my presentation, I am saying that the bottom line is not really so much of excellence, but relevance. We need to respond to it and equities in healthcare, what we know, what we can do, what we can translate in the community. Here comes now your third objective that you want me to look into, and this is the National Unified Health Research Agenda, or the NURA. This means to say that relevance is important. If you are looking at the NURA, then if you're responding to the NURA, then you are a relevant researcher. The National Unified Health Research Agenda is the country's template for health research and development efforts, specifying the areas and topics needed to be addressed in a five-year scope. So look at this. There are five-year scopes. So NURA 2004 to 2010, NURA 2011 to 2016, and the current NURA is 2017 to 2022. If you want to be relevant, if you want to answer the needs of the country, then go to the NURA and look at what it is asking you to look at. Currently, we want you to look at responsive health systems and uh, researches to enhance and extend healthy lives, holistic approaches to health and wellness, health resiliency, global competitiveness and innovation and health, and research in equity and health. So you can download all of this. No? Uh, the, the, the link has been provided for in these slides. So uh, thank you very much, my dear colleagues. I'd like to introduce to you the PAMJ faculty and facilitators for the medical writing for publication training workshop. We conduct this every uh, twice a year for free. So if you have an article to write and you want to bit enhance, just enroll and we will be there to facilitate your learning. Uh, so this is the faculty that we have at the moment. Uh, I am the only nurse present in this uh, faculty. Here we are when we went to Indonesia. 
and in Mongolia. So we used to have Dr. Lapaena as the president, but uh, now it's Dr. Cecilia Lazarte who's the president. I am the executive vice president for internal affairs. So the evolution to intellectual freedom, they say, now this is my last slide, is from being before grad school, you're very uh, optimistic that you're going to do research that whatever you want. And when you go, your professor says you to do this, and then you are after tenure, so you just do what, you know, can be done within the tenure limits until, you know, when you're old already, I'm going to research whatever I want until, you know, if you become a professor emeritus. So with that, my dear colleagues, I end my presentation. I hope I have answered the three objectives that you have given me. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat sa pakikinig. And if you have any questions, then I'm ready to answer. Thank you. Ladies, and there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Dr. Castro Palaganas, for that very comprehensive and uh, mind boggling presentation. Okay, so right now we have some questions, live questions from our participants. Yeah, okay. so uh, before anything else, I would like to remind our participants, especially those in the nursing profession, practice evidence based practice publish your research findings so that we will not perish. Of course, that is coming <laughs> from our speaker. Okay, Dr. Palaganas, you have mentioned a while ago regarding um, um, the practice, the importance of having practice, evidence-based practice in nursing. Now, yes. you also have mentioned statistics with regard that 72.5 or seven out of 10 nurses are not usually using their evidence-based practice to so their experience, usually word of mouth, okay? Mm. So the question is coming from one of our participants is that what are some strategies that can improve evidence-based practice utilization in the undergraduate nursing students? Mm, that's a very uh, interesting question. Uh, that would be a good focus group discussion mm. question. Yeah, yeah, but at the moment, I think, um, we should develop that culture of inquiry wherein if there is something that's boggling you. Hmm. Uh, well, of course, I'm not saying don't ask your peers. You can ask your peers, but you have to go beyond. You have to go beyond asking someone. What does the literature say? You know, I think we have technology on the tips of our hands. You know, you just click, one click of yeah. the, uh, you know, you go to Google uh, and, you, you, you have journals, you have, you go to Google Scholar and it will give you a lot of, you know, articles, peer-reviewed journals and read it. What are they saying? And compare it vis-a-vis -vis just about your current practice. See? Oh, is, um, are what my peers are saying the same as what the journals are saying or is it beyond? So how can I be challenged? I think mm. it's that continuing thing of being challenged to read, to, you know, to discover things and maybe do a research, you know, do okay. a, um, something that will lead you to an evidence, uh, uh, to an evidence. And that is a date, that is a piece of data that you can put together. Okay, ma'am. So, so for example, if I were a undergraduate nursing student right now, how would you convince me to be involved in the research study? <laughs> How will I convince <laughs> yeah. undergrad? Uh, well, aside from it is being part of the um, part of the curriculum, you know, I think what is important is to have a good environment, role okay. models, you know, mm. uh, faculty members who are really uh, encouraging and not punitive, you know, uh, and allowing the students really the undergrad students to. To explore what they want, you guide them, but mm. don't impose on what they would do. You know, because sometimes when you impose, sometimes research is already difficult, and so if you want them to do something that they do not like, it's again another burden to them. So yes. <laughs> allow them to, you know, to discover what is it and guide them towards what is it that they want to to, to answer. Make research something. 
um, uh, that they will appreciate and love and not something that they will hate and say, yes. this is it. After it, no more. Uh, the, uh, it's the end of it. No. So I hope that it's a thing of the past because we have uh, good mentors. We have, you know, challenging and inspiring, passionate um, mentors in research like all of you no because i know uh, you are into your phd because you have passion for research you will not go into your phd if you do not have passion for doing things because phd means research yes and actually maybe it really has a great impact usually to the organizational factors as what you have mentioned before that eight to 90 percent of the factors that why research or evidence-based practice is not practiced because of those factors so i think it would motivate us to become uh, 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 the models okay uh, that would promote research so those who are have bsn degrees remember what dr castro polagana <laughs> said you have to use a critic research findings to so those of master's degree you have to make sure that you're able to be an expert regarding research, you, you encourage your students as well, okay? Do not deny the fact that you are not interested with research. For those who have doctorate and postdoctorate degree, remember to collab with researchers and to do as well funded research projects. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Dr. Castro Plaganas. That was our last question. It was really informative. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. At this point in time, let us proceed to our next resource speaker who will discuss to us how the nursing profession adapts to the current trends in educational pedagogy. To introduce her, let us hear from Mr. Dave Fernandez, head nurse from Alcor Hospital and the chairman of the Briefing and Evaluation Committee. Mr. Dave. you have any questions please feel free to comment on the comment section of our facebook live streaming we are still live here at doha qatar this is nursing today transitions and trends this speaker is a graduate of bachelor of science in nursing as cum laude in 1965 and plays as a ninth in the nursing licensure examination on top the midwifery licensure exam in 1976. She completed her Master of Arts in Nursing in 1973 and PhD in Development Education in 1989 at the University of Santo Tomas. She was a former member of Board of Nursing and a certified maternal and child nursing specialist. Source speaker for more than 50 local and international continuing professional development and trainings. Over the years, she represented the Philippines in International Council of Nurses Conferences. She presented two papers at the ICN conference in Malta in 2011, which ranked third among the top 10 most popular entries. She was the national president of the Philippine Nurses Association from 2009 to 2011. 
wherein she was known for many accomplishments. In addition to that, she authored and co-authored around 30 books and modules, published 12 articles in different professional journals, and completed 11 research and technical papers. With her dedication, hard work, and passion for service, she received notable awards and distinctions, which include the Most Outstanding Nurse Educator in 1997, which is the highest award given by UST to its alumni. The Anastasia Giron Tupas Award as the Most Outstanding Professional Nurse in Year 2000, the highest award given by PNA, Ahulita Sotejo Professorial Chair in 2000 in College of Nursing from UP Manila, Outstanding Teacher of 2008 awarded by University of the Philippines Manila, Outstanding Women Leader in Education given by the City of Manila, 2012 PRC's Most Outstanding Nurse in 2015. She had previously worked in the U.S. and Germany prior to her career as a nurse educator in the Philippines. She was a consultant in Continuing Professional Education of Professional Regulation Commission and was a member of Technical Panel for Nursing Education and Commission on Higher Education. Currently, she is a professorial lecturer at the Centro Escolar University, University of Santo Tomas, and UP Open University. I am highly honored to present our speaker, who is a great example of a leader, educator, practitioner, researcher, and a role model. Without further ado, it is my great privilege to welcome Dr. Teresita Roda Irigo Barcelo. Um, thank you, Dave. I almost did not recognize myself. <laughs> Should I go on, Carby? Can, can I have my slide now? May I have my first slide, please? So while they are present, um, yes, the topic, I, uh, before I go into that, to Dr. Felina Young, the Chancellor of UP Open, of PW University, my co-resource speakers, to the organizers and participants, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me and my congratulations to the organizer, organizers for this very timely topic. The topic assigned to me is shifting nursing education to blended learning. At the outset, I'd like to say I have nothing to declare as conflict of interest. And the content of this presentation uh, were taken from literature, from official documents, and from my own experience as a professor using blended learning uh, approach in education. In my next slide, I would like to show you what I intend to cover in this presentation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, Carvey, may I have the next slide, please? Oh, no, prior, please go back. Sorry, sorry. Uh, please go back to the slide, yes. My outline that I'd like to present are the following. 
what is blended learning, why should we use blended learning, the use of simulation video in blended learning, enablers and barriers to learning. I have two exemplars, the flip, flip classroom and the UP Open University, and of course, my summary. The next slide. Uh, this term blended learning has come up even more popularly now, and it is generally applied to the practice of both online and in-person learning experiences when teaching students. It's also known as hybrid learning or mixed mode learning. Uh, blended learning is, may vary from school to school in terms of their design and execution, which I will show you later in my exemplars. Next slide, please. Blended learning is further called or described as a combination of instruction from two historically separate models of teaching and learning. The traditional, which is face-to-face -face learning systems and the distributed learning system. In blended learning, the emphasis is the role of computer-based technologies. And I suppose this, the advent of uh, these technologies have really pushed us to, to go into blended learning. In the next slide, um, the characteristic of blended learning, next slide please, shows that it is a combination of both the synchronous and the asynchronous online teaching and learning mode. The knowledge transfer is mediated through a, an electronic device. So today you can see students with their iPad, with their laptop, or even with their uh, iPhone. Synchronous online teaching is a person-to-person -person interactivity using online platform like Blackboard Collaborate, which we use at USD, Moodle, which we use at UPOU and as, as well as in CEU, and WebEx. In the next slide, I would like to elaborate further on what is asynchronous online teaching. By the term itself, it means the student is not with the teacher or with the professor. It is a more learner-centered approach that affords opportunity to engage in learning at a time and location that is convenient for the learner. The learning opportunities are self-directed and do not require any human facilitator. It solely depends on the technology. In the, in the asynchronous e-learning context, the learner negotiates mainly uh, independently with the material. Next slide, please. Technological innovation is the prime mover of educational transformation. We are getting this kind of students now, digital natives. They are the newest consumers of our ed higher education. And as you can see, I, I suppose, as you all know, digital natives can easily get bored with a chalk and board, uh, chalk and blackboard kind of teaching. They, they, they're, they're so used to the animated lectures that come from YouTube and, and uh, simulation videos and, and the like. So these digital natives are experienced expecting that their education will have more usability and more convenience for them. In the next slide, uh, there it says that e-learning is, is really a well-documented uh, pedagogical approach that is very beneficial. Uh, some of these benefits are increased accessibility to education. So even those who are not in the uh, 
centers or cities, they're able to access education. Just like you, you are in Abu Dhabi and, and your school is at, uh, located in, in Taf Avenue, Manila. It is efficacious, as, would, as studies would show, that it is as good as, or if not better than, the face-to-face -face, uh, teaching approach. It is definitely cost-effective. Again, I'm sure you all will agree to that. Cost-effective because you can stay in your place of work, continue working while pursuing your doctoral degree. As it is as well, allowing learner flexibility and interactivity, especially with the use of technology. Uh, however, in our country, this is uh, the push for doing blended learning is not so much about this, but more because of the pandemic. We were pushed to, to the wall, so to speak, to go into blended learning. In March 2020, when we were declared, when the country declared a lockdown, we really had to uh, look for alternative solutions because the semester has not ended and we had to complete our subject matter. So really, the blended learning approach was quite, was a big help. In the next slide, if you are to compare, next slide please, if you are to compare the plain e-learning which is using computer, which, which uses learner, learner to material interaction, blended learning is much better. Why? Because there is less likely for the learner to feel isolated or less interested in the subject matter. Why so? Because with the blended learning, uh, the, the distance is mediated by the technology, so the student is able to uh, connect with and interact with colleagues, with the classmates, and with the professor, not just with the material, in order for them to learn the subject matter. So they are less isolated and they are less disinterested. In the next slide, I, uh, it is a common method now to integrate in blended learning simulation videos. Simulation video is the presentation of a realistic situation to simulate real life conditions. And the advantage of this is there is no risk to the student nor to the patient. Why? Because the student is learning through the uh, video. Uh, and the video is supposed to present a realistic clinical situation, which, which means that the student is learning the knowledge and, and of course, uh, in, uh, eventually later uh, the skill, and the patient is not put at risk because the student is a newbie or a novice and doing a procedure for the first time. Uh, furthermore, in the next slide, simulation say, uh, content of simulation videos allows for demonstration of clinical situations that undergraduate students are yet to experience. This will give them like a preview of what to expect when they go to the clinical area. So on the attitude side, they get prepared that this is what they're going to see. In the next slide, there are enablers for bl blended learning. As I mentioned earlier, we were pushed to the wall because of the pandemic and we, had, we were on lockdown. But we needed to complete our semester with our content. So what happened? There's a joint memorandum circular issued by the Department of Health and the Commission on Higher learning. It is the guidelines on the gradual reopening of institutions of, institutions of higher learning campuses for limited 
face-to-face -face classes during the COVID-19 pandemic. This memorandum only applies to six health-related programs, medicine, nursing, medtech, midwifery, PT, and public health, and limited to specialized laboratory courses or hospital-based clinical uh, activities like clerkship, internship, practicum. And only for institutions of higher learning in modified quarantine, uh, general quarantine, uh, community quarantine, or those in the uh, general community quarantine in the Philippines. Okay. The next slide, because because the schools of nursing had difficult time trying to adapt and adjust to this sudden lockdown and, and ending of the semester, the Association of Deans of Philippine Colleges of Nursing, or ADPCN, issued guidelines on flexible learning activities for RLE, or related learning experience, during the COVID pandemic. This is to help nursing schools provide learning, related learning activities uh, in a flexible manner using both synchronous and asynchronous uh, teaching mode. They further uh, proposed the use of the Azure model. And in the next slide, I will elaborate what Azure model is all about. Assure is A for analysis. Analyze the, the learners, the students. What is their condition? Do they have available internet? Do they have the technology? Are they capable or literate for uh, technology use? And what is their level of education? Or what are they, their level in the curriculum? S for statement of learning outcomes, which is whether or not there's pandemic or lockdown or, uh, or uh, blended learning, we do have to have learning outcomes. The uh, second S is selection of media methods and materials. This is very critical because the, the faculty, the university cho must choose the appropriate media methods and materials because you may have very good ob objectives, very good curriculum, but when you do not select the appropriate method, media, and materials, this will not be successful. U uh, refers to utilizing technology, media, and materials. Well, example of which is this distance education uh, and uh, blended learning. R means requires learners' participation, strategies on how to engage students. This is a very challenging component of blended learning, making sure that the students are engaged, especially when they are in the asynchronous mode. Because in the asynchronous mode, they're by themselves interacting with the material. So you really have to come up with very good strategies to ensure that the students are engaged in their own learning. And E, for evaluating the impact of student learning. And we all know that. Those of us who are in education, we all know that evaluation is always a component of the teaching learning uh, technology uh, strategy. In the next slide, some other enablers, such as institutional support, Policies and resources. What does it mean? The university must have policy or policies that will support the faculty and, and resources that will allow the faculty to, uh, to use blended learning. Maybe come up, bring, uh, come up with uh, resources that are uh, available allow rather, give resources that are available for the faculty and for the students. 
uh, another enabler is there should be motivated and competent faculty. Competency of the faculty should not be limited to content because we all know, I suppose, when you become a faculty and you're assigned a subject matter, you're not assigned a, mat a subject matter that you do not know about. But nowadays, with blended learning, it's not just content, also the use of technology. And as an example, myself, when we started with this blended learning, I really was groping on how to use the technology. But because I am passionate with my teaching, I like to teach. So I, I, I tried to learn and I use all possible resources, including my grandchildren, to guide me in the use of the technology. Then, of course, another enabler is the well-designed instructional design. You need to have that. You cannot just, you know, do a um, hit or miss kind of uh, strategy. Then the students are self-directed and motivated. And I think this is the problem with using blended learning or, uh, in fact, distance education learning in among the uh, pupils or basic education. Because at home, it would be the parents who would be, be guiding the students, the pupils. And according to our DepEd, uh, many parents are, are finding it difficult to, to be tutoring their children, especially because they also have to work or that they have limited knowledge about the subject matter. In fact, there's a joke that came out once in the cartoons and it says, teacher, uh, teacher, kunin mo na ako. Ma ang nanay ko palagi nagagalit, hindi ako matuto. <laughs> That's the joke. All right. Now, while there are enablers, there are challenges. So in the next slide, I would like to show you what are these challenges. An example, uh, one challenge is development of simulation videos. This is time consuming and definitely expensive. I had to do uh, uh, two videos for my class at the UP Open University. So it was quite expensive in the, ter in, in, uh, in the sense that there is a director, a photographer, uh, an actor, uh, lighting and all of that and it's not that easy okay if you want to good come up with a quality uh, video and if you are to buy commercially prepared simulation videos make sure that the context is fit to the situation you want to use it for example if they are made in the United States as in my example here a video on our normal labor done in Western countries, normal labor and delivery, is so different from our own labor and delivery set up in the Philippines. Another challenge, in the next slide please, assessment, all right. Assessment of learning is really a challenge. Self-report by the student of behavior change it's not enough. It's, it's all right to ask how did they feel, did they learn, but it's not enough. So there is a need to use objectively measured evaluation criteria like the objective structured assessment of technical skills, especially when using simulation videos or even the simulation, clinical simulation using standardized patients. Another challenge, Another set of challenges, excuse me. In the next slide, problems related to learner engagement in self directed learning. Uh, I, I realized when I started out with OpenU that the, the maturity of the student is very critical, that they are motivated and self-directed because they will be dealing with the uh, learning material directly, interacting with it and, and learn from it. So they need to have, they need to be self-directed. 
Then, of course, limited access to computers and internet connection. In the Philippines, this is a big problem, really big problem. And uh, while they say we are improving, it's still a long way off. Then, of course, limited skills of both teachers and students in the synchronous online teaching. As an example, in the next slide, flip classroom has become very popular. Flip meaning instead of the lecture, uh, the usual is the lecture first, then the assignment. In this one, in flip classroom, you provide the materials already, your lecture, your, your slides, you give it to them. Uh, in an asynchronous session, the students will interact with the material. That, but of course, you provide some structure by way of your guide questions. Then you will uh, ask them to come to a synchronous session where you discuss in person the lesson stress out questions and issues regarding the lesson. You do not anymore provide the content. The content has been given through uh, the materials that the student had to interact with. So flip, you instead of lecturing first, then assignment, here you give them the assignment, give them the material, and then you do the uh, session face-to-face -face and discussion. You don't anymore provide the content. It's been provided prior in an asynchronous session. Another exemplar is, in the next slide, is the case of the UP Open University, which was founded in 1995. It was called mainly distance education. However, even at the time, we were already doing blended learning approach. Why do I say that? Well, initially, I was one of the founding faculty. We used printed modules which we distributed to the students prior, as part of their course. And then once a month in person, there's a session to discuss the content, clarify issues, do formative assessment, and maybe even proctor a summative assessment. With the increase of technology in 2002, UPOU, started to do technology-assisted distance education for its synchronous sessions. Still, we had um, uh, modules provided. Now it is what we call uh, learning resource materials. It's that doesn't have to be always the modules that we have written. And uh, there is this face-to-face -face component. We, we realize that we, there is always a need to have that kind of connection between the faculty and the student, because learning is also a social activity. So I think I have uh, elaborated on what I am supposed to discuss. Why did we have to transform education to uh, blended learning? So in summary, in the next slide, Blended learning is a pedagogical method using a combination of synchronous or face-to-face -face and asynchronous or learner-to-material approaches. This pedagogical method uses technology for its uh, teaching learning activity. So the technology really is central to blended learning. For in the, uh, in the next slide, I say, for blended learning to be successful, there are several requirements. First, the curriculum is based. And there is an alignment <clears throat> between program goals, course goals. Together with this, there should be a well-designed framework and instructional design. Also, the course materials should match the course objectives. These must be appropriate to the level of the student and must be within the context 
uh, of the student or uh, and culture and is accessible. Further, in the next slide, students are motivated and engaged in their own learning and are able to do independent work. This is again critical. And the faculty members are competent, not just in the subject matter, but also in the medium and technology. Further, another thing that is needed for successful blended learning is assessment strategies that are authentic. By authentic, it means it measures the intended learning outcomes. Thus, in answer to the objective of the assigned topic to me, why, what do I say or why, why do we say we have to transform to blended learning? Well, blended learning is an innovative and effective way of teaching the science and the art of nursing, provided we follow those conditionalities that must go with it. And I say in my last two slides, pandemic or not, I foresee that blended learning is here to stay. We have learned how useful it is, and I'm sure whether there is no pandemic or not, there are no more pandemic, schools of nursing will still be using blended learning because we have found that it is a very effective way of teaching uh, nursing content. And I leave you with this uh, quote, the new survival skills, effective communication, curiosity, and critical thinking skills are no longer the skills that only the elite in society must master. They are essential survival skills. And then I have in the, all the next slides, three or more are my references. Thank you very much for listening. Shukran, I said, I think. Yeah, shukran daw. Tsaka salamat po. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That was Dr. Teresita Irigo Barcelo regarding the shift of nursing education to blended learning. We have been shown that blended learning indeed is flourishing regarding education. However, we have encountered some challenges with blended learning and we must be able to adapt to these challenges and provide interventions in order for us to overcome these current challenges. Thank you so much, Dr. Barcelo, for the discussion. So we have here questions for you, Dr. You're Barcelo, welcome. coming from our participants. I think this first question that is coming from our okay. audience have already been answered because this talks about sustainability. But let me read this for everyone's information. Given the global pandemic, approaches in education have changed and adapted to blended and open distance. Sooner or later, face-to-face -face classes may be back. In the Philippines, do you think, Dr. Barcelo, that we are capable of retaining the open distance or blended learning for graduate programs, just like for nursing? So I think that you have answered this one regarding Should I answer that? And you, you said, said I've already that I can still add blended to. learning, whatever yes, there the is a pandemic or not, it yes. will still continue to flourish. Yes. yes. Right? I, I, yes. I, you know why? Because we have realized that there's really no need to be always being with the student. If if you provide good materials and if the professor provides guide questions, the students can interact with the material. And then after which, you have more time for discussion, more time for examples, more time for clarification, rather than spending so much time just giving out the material. So I think it will stay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Barcelo. Now, just a direct question. As a previous Philippine Nurses Association president, okay, 2009, 2011, um, do you think blended learning is at par with face-to-face -face or traditional learning, based on your opinion? Or is yes, it still- Yes, it is at par. Okay. Is it at par? It's like okay. this. 
Mm. Yes, it's very much at par. There are studies already in uh, uh, what you call this integrative reviews already saying that uh, distance education or blended learning is as effective as face to face. Actually, I was I was telling uh, one person was asking me some time ago, uh, why do I? Uh, uh, di ba mas maganda may teacher sa classroom? I said, mm-hmm. if the teacher is just, if the teacher is just discussing, rather giving stories and not the content, that is not, it, it's much better if you have the material already given to them earlier, mm-hmm. they interact okay. with it and then you just clarify, di ba? Okay. So rather than the teacher was just telling stories. Okay. So like synchronous and synchronous. One last question, yeah. doctor. Is there, will there be a possibility that the future of nursing licensure examination will be online as well? The nursing, uh, the Philippine nursing, Philippine nursing licensure exam. Yes. Uh, that has been actually a, a, well, it's been long, maybe five, six years ago. Mm-hmm. Even when I was still a, by the way, I have to correct, I was not with the board of nursing. I was with the board of midwifery because I'm a okay. nurse midwife. All right. Even at that time, when I was in the board of midwifery, nursing was already thinking of doing online mm-hmm. examination, similar to your NLEC, NCLEX. Mm-hmm. But we have, well, there are hurdles, challenges, <laughs> uh, for most of which is, of course, funding. But it's not only just funding. It's also... Uh, availability of technol- uh, people with the right technology. Uh, actually, PRC has gone into online exam for seafarers. So gradually they're moving, but mm-hmm. it is not that easy for, okay. especially for nursing where we have like sometimes 30,000 examinees. That's not logistically very difficult to manage, but I don't know. There's a plan to do that. All right. Thank you, Dr. Barcelo. What is uh, the thing that we know now is the future is amazing, especially for yes. the nursing profession. Yeah, yes. I agree. <laughs> mm-hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Teresita Irigo Barcelo for the lecture discussion. And that was the last question for Dr. Barcelo. Thank you so much, doctor. I hope that our participants are still well and are learning from our webinar. At this juncture, we will be exploring about the various roles of nurses in the global arena. Heads up, as we proceed to our third resource speaker to be introduced by a nurse educator in mental health services, Hamad Medical Corporation, and the chairman of the program and documentation committee. Let us all welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kenneth Katapang. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our third speaker today, who is going to talk to us about exploring new and expanded roles in the global nursing practice. This is a topic in which we should all be deeply interested because it will explore the drivers for advanced practice nursing its identity, and the role of advanced practice nursing in universal health coverage. Our speaker spent almost her entire career on nursing education, leadership, and professional practice. She graduated in 2001 with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Old Dominion University. She later completed her MSN, MBA, and Nursing Administration in 2006 from the Johns Hopkins University and currently taking her doctorate of nursing practice with a focus on health systems leadership from University of Pittsburgh. From 2016 until now, our hardworking speaker is currently employed as the Director of Nursing Education and Professional Practice in Sidra Medicine. Her excellent background as clinical educator, certified pediatric nurse in oncology, interim manager of pediatrics, clinical education, and standards of professional practice has prepared her to focus on the progress in nursing and midwifery workforce development in Sidra Medicine. Furthermore, she is one of the strong proponents to build a strong health workforce that is able to meet the health needs of the national communities 
in a sustainable way in the state of Qatar and provide policy recommendations in order to achieve better workforce outcomes to meet the healthcare needs of the population. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dina Schnurman. Hi, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm just going to Okay, sorry for the technical delay there. Um, my name is Dina Schnerman, and again, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, and thank you so much for um, inviting me to be part of such a distinguished panel of, of nursing professionals. Um, this is something that is extremely close to my heart and something that I work on every day in my career, um, and more and more so trying to expand the roles of nurses and what our nurses can uh, achieve in the workforce today. So over the course of the next few minutes, we'll talk about the drivers for advanced practice nursing, uh, discuss advanced practice uh, nursing roles and global requirements and qualifications for those roles, and explore the role of advanced practice nurses in universal health coverage uh, and access to health, which really does drive uh, the need for these advanced practice roles. And as we think about this, if we think about our previous speakers and everything that we've talked about today so far, as PhD students, um, what we should be looking forward to doing um, is push forward that agenda of nursing science um, and provide the evidence to support these roles moving forward. Um, what kind of research can you do to bring forward the, uh, the evidence uh, to policymakers uh, around the world to show why nurses need these advanced practice roles? Um, and why we need some consistent qualifications um, around the world to support nurses to deliver quality care. Um, so why? What are the drivers for nurses in advanced practice roles? Um, there's so many papers out there, uh, so many white papers, so many research articles um, that show why this is important. The WISH conference, which is, is uh, housed here in Qatar, um, focused on this several years ago, but we know nurses globally uh, provide improved healthcare access and coverage, uh, improved access, access to supportive care, so not just tertiary care, but that supportive care that we need uh, for our patients to bridge from in hospital to home care. We can reduce hospital admissions by using our nurses better at the fullest scope of their roles, um, decrease the use of diagnostic tests. By expanding the autonomy and working at top of scope, uh, Nurse, uh, nursing practice drives satisfaction, um, but it's key. It's key to improving healthcare access and coverage. Uh, advanced practice nurses uh, do provide that effective and sustainable model of healthcare, uh, and advanced practice roles contribute to achieving better care for individuals, not just in low resource countries, in high resource countries as well. Uh, so we see the biggest expansion of advanced practice nurses in high resource, highly resourced countries. But again, we know we get more effective, cost-effective care by using nurse, uh, advanced practice nurses uh, in the fullest scope. So while low resource countries would see the biggest benefit, we're really lagging behind in developing these advanced practice roles and providing the governance uh, at the policy level to support advanced practice nurses, um, as well as the infrastructure to develop advanced practice nurses outside of high resource countries. So we're gonna to start to look at ways to really start to bridge programs to develop uh, advanced practice nurses uh, in lower resource areas. So context setting. So this becomes really, really important. Um, when we think about these advanced practice roles, we really have to think about terms and titles versus the actual role. This actually differs from country to country. Um, so why a PhD nurse uh, is a PhD nurse, wherever you are, you are a nurse scientist, um, what you do may be a little bit different. Um, but globally, titles and roles have different interpretations. So the best examples are the clinical nurse leader and clinical nurse specialists. In North America, these two terms are protected. 
So the clinical nurse leader is actually a licensed role. The clinical nurse specialist is a licensed role. Um, it's not just a title that you confer on someone um, because they are a specialist in their area. It's actually a whole separate education and training. However, if we look at different countries around the world, we'll see these titles being used. And certainly in my, my own organization where I'm at now, we use the term uh, clinical nurse specialist or clinical nurse leader um, in a very different way than the licensed clinical nurse specialist and clinical nurse leader would be used. Um, and since we're an internationally based cohort, we really have to think about this and how are we using these titles and what they mean. And I'm going to use this as the context to kind of start to compare. Um, uh, I'm going to use North America and England as, as my comparison countries. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is because a lot of uh, globally, a lot of nursing legislature and a lot of uh, nursing practice you'll see the, the verbiage come out of these two countries. And I'm using the NHS in England as opposed to all of the UK, because the UK um, in different areas of the UK, in Scotland and Ireland, they do have different legislation uh, and different titles. So I'm using the NHS as set in England. So as we move forward, I want you to keep this in mind as I start to compare. I'll bring in the global context as well, but I will do my biggest comparison between the US and the UK. So the roles I'm going to explore today are nurse practitioner, clinical nurse specialist, nurse anesthetist, and nurse prescriber. Now I have to say when I started my slides, this list was much longer. I had nurse educator, which you know, is my background, uh, nurse facilitator, nurse informaticist, nurse scientist, uh, PhD nurses, our nurse scientists, and doctor of nursing practice, which is where I come from, the DNP side, where we apply the evidence that our PhDs discover. Um, but as my slides were running into the hundreds, I actually just had to stop uh, and refocus my slides to make sure that I'm really, really concise with what we need to talk about an advancing practice of nursing. While we have the roles of nurse educator and nursing informaticists, we cannot live without. Um, when we talk about advancing uh, roles in nursing, these are very specific uh, roles that I do want to discuss because we have such great opportunities to move them forward. So our first role that I would like to look at is the nurse practitioner. So a nurse practitioner is the highest top of scope uh, role that we have. Uh, it's an advanced practice registered nurse. Um, and you can see even the definition right now as we start off is a little bit different. We do see in both countries, we have the, uh, a nurse practitioner can order, can interpret uh, diagnostic and laboratory tests. They can diagnose, they can prescribe, they can evaluate treatment plans. In the NHS, we see the same. Advanced practice nurses have the freedom, they have the autonomy, they have the authority to assess, diagnose, and treat. Um, so we have this kind of highest scope of nursing practice. Um, nurse practitioners do work in other countries, uh, in Botswana, Australia, New Zealand. We do have nurse practitioners here in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, in Oman, uh, in Dubai, in Qatar. We have about 12 nurse practitioners, etc. cetera. Um, but the, um, we don't have a primary training program here in the Middle East. So when we're training nurse practitioners, we actually have to send them abroad to be trained. This becomes an issue, and we'll talk about this quite a, quite a bit later in, in the program. Um, because you have to have a nursing license and a, and a pin, an NMC pin, in order to undertake these programs. Um, so they have to go through the entire qualification process to be licensed in another country, um, which sometimes is quite onerous. So it's not as easy as just, I'm going to take one of my, uh, my nurses, I'm going to send them to the United States in order to um, get a nurse practitioner license. That means they have to sit for the NCLEX, they have to get a US nursing license. So they have to go through that whole process, which might seem quite daunting to, especially my young uh, national nurses who we're trying to, to grow nurse practitioners from. Um, so but there are some differences now in the US and the NHS, how we qualify our nurse practitioners. Um, in the US, again, the term is protected. So nurse practitioners uh, the, the term nurse practitioner is quite protected. In the UK, in the NHS, uh, NPs don't always have a recognizable or standardized role or training. So we're gonna go into the training um, in just a moment. So if I look in the US, nurse uh, practitioner authority actually differs in each state. Um, so nurse practitioners have full practice authority in 20 states, which means um, they can actually 
um, open their own clinic, they can write, uh, write prescriptions, they can work under full authority under their own license. Um, we have reduced and restricted practices. We see the dark blue states tend to be in the South into more conservative states. Nurses actually can, nurse practitioners can actually open their own clinic. They would have to work under a physician or a physician needs to provide oversight of their, um, of their practice. Now, again, when we think about our PhD nurses and, and the quality of uh, research that you bring, what we look for is now efficacy studies. So we're looking for efficacy studies and how much more cost effective uh, and efficacious are nurse practitioners doing this role than say a family physician um, or uh, especially in rural areas where it's really, really hard to maintain uh, medical staff. Are nurse practitioners providing the same level of care and care coordination uh, as medical uh, colleagues in a um, in a high uh, needs area, low resource area. Um, and so we keep looking to build this information and build this data. And you'll see varying studies out there. There's a, a research study that came out recently um, that talked about uh, nurse practitioners prescribing opioids uh, more frequently than medical colleagues. Uh, so then that brings into question, uh, is it because the, uh, the patients required it and the physicians are just not uh, are not prescribing what the patients need or nurse pr pr uh, practitioners over prescribing. And so that's what we're really looking to, to drive research on, especially uh, in North America at the time. So if we look at the training and requirements, and again, as I look um, to build workforce uh, and, and to, to build an entire workforce and to develop a workforce, especially here in, in my role, um, how do I make a nurse practitioner? How do we, how do we uh, build nurse practitioners if we don't have a program here in country? So in the US, it is a master's degree level. Uh, uh, starting in 2025, all entry level uh, nurse practitioners must have the doctorate. So the doctorate of nursing practice, uh, that is the level of entry for 2025. And I know a lot of programs uh, have just moved to the DNP program now. So they're bridging a lot of the master's students and they're just now um, pulling out their DNP students. Um, there's a standardized training program, preceptor clinical hours. Uh, the program can be about 19 months to about three years long, depending on how many breaks they take. Um, now in the NHS in the UK, so we have multiple program titles. A master's degree is required but there's multiple titles. You can have a master's in advanced nursing practice. You can have a master's in advanced clinical skills, master's in advanced clinical practice. There's many different titles. And what the NHS has done, which is quite clever, is that they've actually opened up a lot of these programs. So it's no longer advanced nursing practice. It's advanced clinical skills, advanced clinical practice. So respiratory therapists will be taking the same program. Um, and so you can be going to um, a master's program for, to become a nurse practitioner, um, but be in a program with a lot of interprofessional colleagues, um, which is, is a great track. However, when we look to license uh, nurse practitioners now outside of the UK, it becomes very, very tricky for us. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So certification. Uh, so how do we certify someone as a nurse practitioner after they've completed their training? Uh, in the US, it is a post-degree national licensure exam. Um, so once you finish your NP uh, schooling, uh, your 19 months to your three years, you then have to take a post-degree national licensure exam. Um, and everybody dreads the boards. This is their, uh, their NP boards. Uh, you take it in the specialty that you train for. So if you're a pediatric, you take the pediatric boards. If you're a family nurse practitioner, you take the family nurse practitioner board. And then you apply for your license. So once you're certified by the board, you apply for your license, which is regulated by the state. And as we showed the map earlier, um, it's going to be a little bit different what your scope of practice is depending on the state that you're licensed in. Um, in the NHS, there's actually no separate category or qualification to be recognized as an NP on the NMC register. Um, so, and it's come out, and this is through the NHS, that the role has not been very, very well developed. Um, so there's neither a separate registry or separate qualification. 
Um, and because of this, there's just not an easy way to standardize the roles. Um, so it becomes the governance of the institution to then vet uh, and validate the education and training of the candidate as opposed to one central board or one central body that says, yes, this person is a nurse practitioner. Again, this causes some challenges on our side when, when we have uh, nurse practitioners from other countries who are now coming to Qatar. Um, and if they don't have that kind of board certification, but they have the education and qualification, it becomes quite tricky to then get them licensed in this country. Um, we'll see how this difference is uh, when we talk about our next, our next role, which is the clinical nurse specialist. Um, one of the things that tends to differentiate um, the two programs uh, for the US and the NHS um, is the pharmacology piece. For the United States, um, a nurse practitioner will have pharmacology, a rigorous pharmacology um, program that is embedded throughout their training. In the NHS, the prescriber piece is actually different. So you'll see a little, um, uh, you'll have somebody graduate with a master's in advanced clinical practice, but then not have that pharmacology piece. And then what would qualify them to move then to Qatar to be a licensed nurse practitioner is that extra prescriber's course. Um, and I'll talk about what the difference is at the end of this because it's actually quite interesting how it's done. So clinical nurse specialist, this role is one of my most challenging roles um, in, my, in my current job now. Um, so again, the, the definition is quite the same. These are advanced practice nurses. They tend to manage uh, the care and provision for complex patients. Um, and we'll define what those uh, complex, pa complex patients are in just a moment. So they provide, again, diagnosis, treatment, ongoing management of patients, and they provide expertise to support nurses caring at the bedside, but also with work with interdisciplinary teams to make sure that we're combining care uh, in a collaborative way and making sure that the patient or that whole patient population uh, is served by the entire healthcare system. Again, we're looking to ensure the best practices, evidence-based care, best patient outcomes. So they're looking not for the individual patient level, but more on that whole cohort uh, of patients. Um, and you'll see the pop it can be defined by population, by setting, uh, by disease, by type of care or type of problem. So we can have a pain nurse specialist, wound care nurse specialist, uh, pediatric, geriatrics, women's health, clinical nurse specialist, critical care, emergency room. So they can be defined in many, many different ways. Um, and if we think about our nurse practitioners, uh, do we think they're trained the same? And the answer is absolutely not. In both countries, um, they are trained very differently once again. This causes an issue now when we have uh, qualified nurses emigrating and working in different countries and getting uh, licensed by different boards. So if I think about uh, the clinical nurse specialist scope of practice here in the state of Qatar, which I'm quite familiar with, this is the wording actually. This is the, the wording from the National Association of Clinical Nurse Specialists in the US. But if you read the scope of practice of the clinical nurse specialist here in the state of Qatar, um, this is a uh, lift and shift from there. So they actually use the American definition. Also an issue because this actually changed. This changed in about 2015, 2016. Um, in Qatar, uh, they used to align to the NHS version of what a clinical nurse specialist was, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, but in about 2015, 2016, they changed the scope of practice, um, which became a huge issue um, for anybody who would come uh, from the NHS to be licensed as a clinical nurse specialist. Um, for those of you who are in the state of Qatar, you'll know that that was just about the point of time that we started licensing nurses. Um, and so a change in the definition and the qualifications of a clinical nurse specialist became quite a disruptive issue. So I'm gonna move on to my next slide and we'll talk about now the training and requirements. So once again, very, very different on how we train clinical nurse specialists. In the US, again, it's a protected role. I would not be able to call myself a clinical nurse specialist despite the fact that I have 20 years of experience in pediatric oncology nursing, but nurse transplant nursing. I don't meet that criteria because I don't have my master's degree as a clinical nurse specialist. I have never taken a certification exam. Uh, and so I don't have a specific license as a clinical nurse specialist. Uh, it is a very protected term in the United States. In the NHS, 
Um, the role uh, is defined as possessing the specialist knowledge, skills, and competencies, and exhibits up-to-date specialist knowledge. Um, so uh, for those of you who might remember uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Canaby, who was at Muhammad, uh, she did an amazing article where they went through 100 JDs, job descriptions of clinical nurse specialists in the UK, to try to see what the, uh, the minimum qualifications are for clinical nurse specialists across the NHS. Um, and when they did this, they found that only 53% of the roles um, required some sort of postgraduate qualification, so like a PG certification, um, but only 2% of the roles across the 100 job descriptions that they reviewed um, required a master's degree. Um, so again, as that is the level of entry for the clinical nurse specialist in the US, in the NHS, it became much more about did this person have the necessary skills, knowledge, and competencies and experience with the patient population, as opposed to being licensed? Um, they did find that there was a high level of consistency across the domains on what the scope of the role was within the NHS, um, but there was a huge variability on both the level of experiment, uh, experience, post-registration qualifications, uh, and the job descriptions. They found very large uh, variability in what the job description was. Um, the same was found for New Zealand, that there, there's a, a lack of a national definition. Uh, in Australia, the same. There are inconsistencies, again, on how the role is defined, but most notably about the requirements. What is the baseline requirement to be a clinical nurse specialist? So again, why this is important, especially for me and my role here in the state of Qatar, uh, is because uh, many, many nurses, especially who worked in the NHS, um, have been practicing at this clinical nurse specialist level um, for many, many years um, in the UK. And then we've hired them as clinical nurse specialists to come in. And then in that time, uh, the licensing requirement changed. And so now we have a group of nurses who've been practicing at the highest level in their home country. And now we bring them here and they are limited in scope um, to that of a general scope nurse um, because they no longer can work at that level. Um, now, why this is a dissatisfier? Because, um, again, they've been working at this advanced level. Uh, and now we have a group of disengaged staff that we have to work on making sure that we put some sort of um, uh, mechanism in for them to continue to work at their advanced level. But the master's degree is the requirement in the state of Qatar. So now getting them licensed is also a challenge uh, because the training requirement is a clinically focused master's degree. So while we'd love to be able to uh, provide them an online training program, uh, send them for an advanced master's degree. The requirement uh, is a clinically focused master's degree. Uh, so it has to be very specific. They have to show that they have those clinical clinical hours and not just, um, not just the training or not just the degree. Uh, and we have had nurses go um, and get a master's degree and say, well, I have a master's in nursing and now I want to be a clinical nurse specialist. Uh, and unfortunately, they don't meet that right, the criteria uh, of a clinical nurse specialist. Uh, so we have to be very, very careful. And this is where we have to um, look at outside universities to start to have really good affiliation training agreements um, to have that practice uh, or that uh, supervised practice be at our institution uh, and look to build those bridges with outside universities to develop these clinically uh, focused nursing uh, uh, advanced nursing roles within our country without sending people elsewhere. So nurse anesthetists, this is a, a really amazing group of nurses. So certified registered nurse anesthetists are also advanced practice nurses who administer anesthesia and other medications. They work with anesthesiologists, doctors, surgeons to provide anesthetics to patients of all ages, uh, from infants all the way to geriatrics. So they can prepare patients for anesthesia, um, they can do the PAT testing, they can be, do pre-op uh, teaching, they can administer the anesthesia, they intubate patients, um, they maintain anesthesia during operation and manage recovery from anesthesia. So I can always say working with nurse anesthetists in the States, this group of nurses was just the, generally the most amazing. A lot of them have come from really interesting backgrounds, a lot of military medics. You have to have two years of exper uh, experience, at least in an ICU, um, showing that you can manage drips. Um, it is, in the U.S., it is one of the most highly paid nursing roles. Nurse anesthetists make upward of $200,000 uh, a year. Um, they have heavy malpractice insurance, uh, but it is a, it's a highly coveted role. It's, they're very, very competitive schools to get in there. Um, so globally, though, what does nurse anesthetist practice look like? Um, 
Nurse anesthetists participate in more than 80% of all anesthesia in the world and are the sole providers in 60% of the cases. So again, if we think about nurses working in the absolute top of scope, this is one of the jobs, right? So they're intubating patients, they're maintaining anesthesia during surgery. There is an international federation of nurse anesthetists that has 43 member countries. Uh, I urge you to, to take a look at the website and to see uh, where they practice. They have a really uh, interesting part as well that they talk about the rules and regulations defining qualifications for each country. And once again, as we see with the nurse practitioner um, and nurse um, and clinical nurse specialist, it varies from country to country of what the minimum qualification for a nurse anesthetist is. Um, across the world. Um, so we have a, from, in addition to a nursing license, a nurse anesthetist in Croatia would require just a vocational degree, uh, where again in the US they require a three year master's degree, and then once again in 2025 it would be requiring a, doctor, a doctorate in nursing. Um, and then we have all levels in between. Um, and so I went through every scope for every single country to take a look. Um, and it, it varies so widely um, where there is no main minimum qualification. Um, so like I said, if you go to Croatia, you can work as a nurse anesthetist with a vocational degree, um, but in the US it becomes very restrictive. restrictive. Um, now, this also becomes an issue if you have a nurse who you want to train as a nurse anesthetist or a nurses who want to train who come to you and say, I would like to train as a nurse anesthetist anesthetist, what would you advise? And even in the top schools in the US, they say, if you are going to practice in another country, you have to investigate what the criteria is in your country because it's so different all over the world. Um, but again, if you think about the low resource countries and the impact that having a nurse anesthetist in these low resource countries would be um, to be able to perform uh, surgery and a sole provider in 60% of the cases, it's a huge expansion of the workforce. Um, so we need to be able to support nurses to develop in these roles. Um, we also find that we have some, some working as a nurse anesthetist, sorry, I'm running out of time, um, uh, under the CNS license. So once again, that ambiguity of what is a clinical nurse specialist, so you can be a clinical nurse specialist in anesthesia. Um, so we have such ambiguity about the, the terms, especially globally. So if we think about now, um, really uh, building the scope of nurses at the bedside. Um, the nurse prescriber is uh, the last role that we'll talk about today. Um, the International Council of Nurses describes nurse prescribing as distinct from the supply administration and involves determining what medication the patient should have, the correct dosage and duration of treatment. So it is prescribing in the fullest sense of the word. Um, and what this is, is an expanded role for uh, general scope nurses. So our bedside nurses with this expanded role. Um, we'll see this more in outpatient clinics. Um, and if we see where this exists around the world, so we see in Sweden, Botswana, Ireland, Netherlands, New Zealand, South Africa, um, and the UK, uh, nurses prescribe under different models in these countries, um, and they either fall under a dependent or independent model, um, but they, again, have an expanded scope in addition to their just their nursing role. Um, so the UK has the absolute most extensive prescribing legislation, and since 2012, nurse prescribers have been able to independently prescribe any medication uh, within their clinical competence. So you can't use the whole formulary, but it's where, whatever falls within your clinical competence. Um, so in the UK, there's approximately 19,000 nurse prescribers, which represent 3% of the nursing workforce. And if we think about, again, this is a fantastic use of nursing skills, um, especially for certain populations. Um, if we think about diabetes population, uh, high blood pressure, geriatrics, we have such an opportunity now for nurses to run nurse-led clinics, um, because how we adjust medications for those um, those diseases becomes very specific. Um, and when you're a nurse working in this clinic day after day, you understand the algorithm, you understand the patients, and you understand the, the clinical requirements. Um, so expanding that scope uh, becomes a really worthwhile cause for us to, to look as nurse leaders to really start to lobby um, governments to, to allow nurse prescribing in other countries. Um, 
So how they train nurse prescribers, it's a short course. It's about eight months part time. It does talk about legal, ethical, uh, professional, pharmacology, uh, and therapeutics. Now, one of the main issues is, again, they have to have the NMC pin. So I can't send a nurse from here to do the short course in nurse prescribing. They actually have to be licensed in the UK. They have to have an NMC pin, and they have to be trained there. Um, the good part about it is um, they can do this and then add on the nurse practitioner. So remember I said one of the big differences was the prescribing. In the US, it's all part and parcel. You have one course, uh, nurse practitioner with prescribing. Um, but in the UK, they separate it. And you can actually prescribe before you become a nurse practitioner. Again, we're looking at fullest extent of that nurse role and using nurses in new ways. Um, so really quickly, I'm at the end here. So what are some of our facilitators and barriers as we move forward? It's really looking at consistency of these terms and the requirements globally. How can we have a global workforce with such varied definitions and training requirements? Um, the other thing is the standardized frameworks of practice um, to support nurses to work in their roles globally. We do have a much more transient workforce. And it's, a, again, up to us as nurse leaders to look at synthesizing and harmonizing these roles around the world, supporting legislation, uh, laws and legislation around practice. Again, as uh, PhD nurses, this really becomes our, uh, um, our job to build the evidence and provide the evidence uh, to support laws and legislation to allow nurses to work in advanced practice roles uh, and ensure that we have collaborative pro provider relationships to allow nurses to work in these roles. Um, I believe that is the end. So thank you so much for your time. And that was Ms. Norman on her topic regarding the various roles nurses play in the current setting. So nurses, have you ever thought of shifting your career from just a clinical bedside nurse to advanced practice nurses? Do you want to be a nurse practitioner, a clinical nurse specialist, or nurse anesthetist, or even a nurse prescriber? Okay, well, thank you so much, Ms. Norman, for that invigorating topic that you have shared to us. I know some of the nurses here are really interested of maybe going to the U.S. or to the NHS in the U.K. Well, we have some questions for you to ask by the audience. Okay, first question, any statistics on the number of nurse specialists in the Middle East? How is the acceptance of nurse practitioners in these countries at present? So uh, are there any number of statistics? Uh, so uh, for our clinical nurse specialists, so we do have, we have a number of clinical nurse specialists. Again, I can speak to Qatar, um, mm -hmm. to the state of Qatar. We do have quite a number of nurse specialists, especially at Hamid. They've done a really, really good job of training nurses and moving them forward. Um, in that clinical nurse specialist role. Uh, I just have to say, we have a challenge uh, currently in, in um, uh, certifying our clinical nurse specialists because of that very background. And so we're, that's one of our goals right now is to really make sure that we provide a good environment uh, to allow the licensing board to certify our clinical nurse specialists after they come back and have been trained. Yes, do you think, Ms. Norma, that there will be a more expansion of nursing roles in the future? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. We can't do without it. <laughs> yes, I do believe as well on that one. Well, there is a next question from one of our participants as well. Ms. Norman, on your opinion, how do you think can advanced practice nursing roles be leveraged to support the nursing and workforce development? Honestly, it's the evidence. We have to show the evidence. We have to show how much more cost effective nurse practitioners mm -hmm. are um, and the high quality of care um, and the better management of patients that we get with nurse practitioners. 
um, you know, as our colleague said earlier, um, we can't move forward uh, to support this without the evidence to demonstrate that. All right. Thank you, Ms. Norman. Actually, we, I have still a lot of questions to ask, but I, because we are time bound, we need to uh, limit some questions. But uh, anyways, if our participants are interested, can they email you their questions? Yes, absolutely, please. Okay. Yeah, we will keep in touch with them. And that was the last question for Ms. Dinesh Norman. Thank you very much, ma'am. That was really informational. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, to our audience, are we still up? Oops, do not touch that mouse because we are still live. This is Nursing Today, Transitions and Trends. And it's, of course, vital to portray a balance between work and life. But how could this be even possible in nursing? Ever wondered why? Let's find out at Ms. Melody Sarmiento, the head nurse of al Wakra Hospital and chairman of the Registration and Certificate Committee, as well as the incumbent president of the Association of Nursing Service Administrators of the Philippines Qatar chapter, will introduce our fourth and last speaker. Multifaceted, that is what nursing practice is. And the current backdrop to this five votal, albeit challenging, profession is a world that is ever dynamic, often disruptive, highly virtual, and largely globalized. An organization's culture, particularly that of the nursing service, plays a major part in supporting nurses as they dispense their roles and capacities in different levels. Nurse leaders occupy crucially vital positions in advocating for and fostering joy at work and resilience for nurses. We are privileged to have with us today a fellow nurse whose career includes stints in the fields of nursing practice, education, research, and leadership. He started out as staff nurse and practiced for five years in 1994 to 2000 until he progressed to become manager and eventually assistant director for training in 2000 to 2003 in San Juan de Dios Hospital in Manila. He was professor in Pamantasan and Lunsod ng Manila, Concordia College, Arellano University, and St. Paul University, Manila. He was the former dean of San Juan de Dios from 2004 to 2005. As a researcher, our speaker did several studies to improve the practice of nursing in various capacities. He was the founding chairman of San Juan de Dios Educational Foundation Incorporated nursing research team. As a consultant, he designed programs Aim at improving quality systems, nursing care outcomes, and patient safety, particularly addressing needs in equipping nurses and administrators with necessary skills to implement and innovate on programs on continuous quality improvement. He also led the creation of various research programs and evidence-based practice models. Our speaker is also a nurse administrator, holding the director of nursing service role in San Juan de Dios from 2005 to 2019, and currently the chief nursing officer of Manila Doctors Hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the Association of Nursing Service Administrators of the Philippines National President and founder of ANSEP Qatar Chapter, Dr. Rodolfo C. Borromeo. Pleasure to have you, doctor. Thank you, Melody. Can I share my slide? Again, thank you, Melody, for the generous introduction. And uh, I would also like to uh, thank the organizers, the 
Philippine Women's University graduate program, PhD program, uh, for the invitation. And it was really uh, quite surprising when the MC and the host mentioned about, is it possible for, for nurses to, be, to find joy at work? And when I learned about the topic that I was given, uh, initially I was, I was really surprised and then really that, um, asked myself the same question. Was there really joy in, in, in working, especially in the healthcare facility? But then again, we have to look at how we created the culture of resilience despite the current pan pandemic that we're having. During trying times, we have to also look at how we led no? Our, our respective health facilities, despite all the pressures and crises. Let me just uh, uh, allow me to, to share to you the things that we have started and things that we've been doing up until now in, on, on uh, trying to be resilient and, and achieving uh, things that we have done despite of the challenges of the current situation. Allow me to uh, disclaim that uh, we do not, I do not have any claim of ownership to some of the concepts and studies presented and do not have any relevant financial interest in presenting a conflict of interest to disclose. So what are the things that we are going to expect in my presentation? Describe the joy of work, of, of work in nursing leadership and clinical practice. I'll be also looking at the roles and expectations of, among us nursing leaders and identify challenges experienced by us leaders and share initiatives that showed our culture of resilience. Hopefully I can integrate also values that for us nursing leaders that should be manifested during and even beyond crisis. Let me just share to you the first slide. Now this is about uh, Henry Ford's statement about uh, finding joy at work. He said, there is joy in work. There is no happiness in, uh, except in the realization that we have to accomplish something. So he was looking at milestones. He was looking at success stories. He was looking at achieving the desired goals and objectives. On the other hand, Jerome Lawrence mentioned that it's always a joy that, that when you wake up in the morning and there's work to do. And that is really something relevant, I should say, because there are a lot of people right now who doesn't have or do not have work. And for us nursing leaders, we have to be reminded to rejoice our work and never lose our sight of the nursing leader we are right now. We have to look at our mission and the nursing leader we will be in the future. But then again, joy may not be the first thing that comes into our mind when we think about work. The reality is after work, it is called, after all, it is called work which is not always thought of as joyful, like what the MC mentioned earlier. But we have to look at joy in the workplace, which makes a difference not only on how we feel about work, but how we work and appreciate the passion of working, even if we are really very tired. And happy employees just are, are not just the responsibility of the supervisor, oftentimes you kept on blaming our supervisors, that we have to be motivated by the people around us. The leaders that we have should always consistently motivate us. Of course, that's given, but it, then again, it is something within us that should find and discover the joy on the things that we do. And, and this is another good article in really uh, looking at uh, nurse leaders burnout. Today, much of the burnout researches and discussions have been concentrated in the front line, especially those in the direct care. And oftentimes the reaction would be the same item that I mentioned earlier, that work which is not always thought as joyful. But then again, for us nursing leaders, we have to take into consideration that we also operate within the same risk similar to what somehow similar to what those in the operational level are experiencing because of the burden of disciplining people, organizational and operational stresses. But, but yet conversely, nurses can still derive joy from their work and garner compassion, satisfaction, and potentially reducing burnout because each one of, 
each one of us can still find and create joy in our workplace. Let me just share to you a study about uh, the self-care of nurse leaders during a, a, a very crucial situation in their, in their respective career. They, 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 they created and implemented the self-care simple meditation. And mind you, it, it went out very well because it significantly dropped after they have implemented the, the stress, perceived stress level after six months and after 12 months of implementation. Well, it is always about really sharing communication, collaboration, decision-making, and staffing, complement, recognition, and leadership that would create a sustaining health work environment. And another study, if I may share, it's about the mile one. The mile one is about the model of interrelationship of leaders, environment, and outcomes. This allowed the mile one developed the operationalization of nurse executive influence. It allowed and defined measurement of the CNEs and provide a framework to structure and articulate the patient and its workforce. But then again, despite all the things that I mentioned earlier, how do we see the 21st century leadership in general? Allow me to share to you Cowley's uh, statement the looming challenges of the 24th century demands that we urgently prepare leaders who can think and act globally. They are going to wait for 21st century. This is the same, this is exactly the time for us to respond to the call of Cowley because we need to be globally uh, uh, participating in global you know, initiatives, especially right now during these time times. We are not only looking at our, our national national concerns, it's an international, it's a global concerns that demanded from all of the sectors, from all of the industries. That is why in the 21st century learning steers, we have to start really communicating a lot. We have to collaborate a lot. We have to extensively provide and initiate and, and educate our workers and nurses on how to critically think and be creative. And of course, we, we cannot do away with millennial generational gaps because we have to accept that we have people under this generation and we should be expecting more because expect more aggressive generation through the Generation Z. And more than their, here, I mean, more than their leaders always think about the directions upward. But after realizing the current situation right now, we should be masters of the 360 degree game-changing leadership skills. And in the leadership skills, these things will always be present. Innovation, technology, healthcare needs of the family, family involvement, patients involvement, of course, value for money, and even those who are uninsured. Leaders are by definition change makers. When we are called to lead, we are ready to advance, move forwards, and improve the situation. And it is not enough for us to structure, technically and structure, structurally grow, but we also have to level up our people to the demands of the future. And demanding, I mean, preparing our nurses for, for the future is not only preparing them during this stage. We have to go back and see how students are prepared as well. So we have to connect education and practice at all costs. And once they are here, we have to provide them with the best career opportunity for them. Provide them with autonomy. Provide them with education, recognition, all the things for them to discover the value of their work and for them to be happy when they are working. And well, while everyone faces challenges in life, it is a matter of how we learn to overcome this and use them to our advantage. But then again, it has always been our desire to ensure positive practice environment, a healthy workplace. But unfortunately, we were stormed by COVID-19 pandemic. That's the sad part 
2020 was really devastating. We commuted in different avenues and really we were affected and we don't know our enemy. It was really a guessing game. A guessing game means a mystery when it all started in Wuhan. In Wuhan, we, we just thought that it was just okay, not until we were blown away by the data around the world. In Italy, in the United States, in UK, in, in Spain, we were bloated with so many infected uh, uh, people, including healthcare workers. And it, it all, well, we, we were all in panic. And, but then again, we have to respond to it. We don't have to manic, panic because we have to think critically. We have to, to, to be more uh, aggressive in our move and we have to be more uh, relevant in, in the healthcare system uh, during those times. And sad thing, even our workers, healthcare workers were affected. Doctors, nurses, nursing assistants, everyone in the hospital were affected. And they were very anxious, including their family. And we were even uncertain about rights. So even wearing of PPEs was questioned. But then again, after hearing a psychiatrist, a psychiatrist who mentioned that it's okay not to be okay, meaning we have to acknowledge all the things, failures or whatever mental disorders or whatever difficulties we have psychosocially, we have to understand that it's really okay not to be okay and acknowledge all these things. Otherwise, we'll not be able to address it you know, uh, 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 effectively. And let's embrace reality and even it, if it burns us. According to Bill Gates, the fact that there was no catastrophic pandemic in the recent history doesn't mean that there won't be another in the future. And we are not certainly not prepared for the next pandemic. And we, our presence is needed. And our presence could ensure that the whole person will never be alone and the person will feel connected with us. And if we are not going to put our acts together, who else will? Action is the fundamental key to success. Imperfect action is better than perfect in action because success consists of going from one failure to, to another without losing our enthusiasm. And this is about the power of resiliency. Resiliency is about our ability to thrive and face adversity, which is what is going on right now. It, we should uh, really develop and internalize resiliency and measure to improve retention and reduce burnout. Nurse leaders, have, we have all our professional obligation to develop within ourselves resiliency and try to infect also the people around us. And how? We have to strategize. We have to implement and execute positive relationship, maintaining positivity, positivity among us and the rest of our team members, develop emotional insight, create our work-life balance, and reflecting on our successes and challenges as well. Resiliency is about adaptability and learning from our experience and become flexible later on. And this is a good practice. I mean, this is a good card reminding nurses and, and caregivers givers with the 10 things to do each day. Get enough sleep, get enough uh, food to eat, vary the work that you do, do some light exercises, do something pleasurable, focus on what you did well, learn from your mistakes, share private jokes, pray, meditate, and support your colleagues. And, and the most resilient workers are those that know how to turn their feelings to work mode when they go on duty, but off work mode when they go on off duty. Well, this is obvious not only in our health facility, but also in all health facilities around the world. We had certain just of PPE. We had uncertainty of indication if it's used, isolation from family, fears of transmitting the virus to the family, rapidly growing and expanding workload due to increased number of cases, progressively depleting workforce, incidents of hostility and aggression, even ranting the Facebook, lack of effective treatment, recalibrating our infection control practices and all other delivery system guidelines, absenteeism, and so many others things on top of these challenges. Initially, I thought 
my nursing, uh, my student career was the most uh, craziest one, not until I went to the hospital and started working. But then again, it added 50% when we had these challenges and crisis right now. We were hit by the retention rate. We lost 30%. And after all of these challenges, I asked myself, how am I supposed to find joy in the middle of this? It is really a continuous discovery. It's really finding joy on, what, joy on what you do. And finding joy is really a challenge that was accepted by us, including my team. And one way to start to look at how we can properly strategize is we revisited our core purpose. Went back again to our strategy map, looking at the very same indicators that we started our successes in the past operational excellence, concept, customer centeredness, harmonizing relationship, precise execution of our, our operational system, and managing talent such as finance. And I concentrated more on how we harmonize. We still empowered our people. There should be no blaming. Uh, there should be no blame. There should be no, uh, our organization should always practice no blame culture or just culture. We continue to, uh, to escalate and, and upscale our, our nurse leaders. We continue discovering talents. We value people and we have always acknowledged them for their best practices. And we continue to, pra to have practical, efficient, and substantial onboarding strategies because we need to complement our staffing. And continuous training, research, and development was there consistent evaluation of learning outcomes and evaluation of what, how, and how they feel right now. And I would like to look at finding joy within the eight areas where I found relevant when we started our, our uh, uh, responses to during pandemic. And uh, these were all exhausted from, from literature, literature review, but let me just take it one by one. Drive everyone to, to joyful at work. Do not be too serious and, and encourage everyone to find time to laugh. We have pocket meetings, but in our pocket meeting, it's not enough that we just discuss things and, uh, and, and important things seriously, but we should always address things positively. There should be no negativity that surrounds us. We have to always look at things positively. And Look at things positively is always enjoying work, even in very crucial moments. And enjoying work should not compromise also celebrating even uh, special occasions like Valentine's Day. Yes, we have, we have to protect ourselves. Yes, we have to always observe physical, uh, physical uh, distance because these are, the new no this is, these are the things that we have to face because of the demands of the new normal. But then again, it does not, it should not lose our, 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 our way in discovering joy at work. Number two, let's find a way to overcome fears and stress. Help our people understand more on what is happening. Let's manage their anxiety. And, and, and this, is, this picture shows a nurse who's really focused on carrying out her task that provides patient care, who doesn't mull on the fact that she is a frontliner, but she just to her work. On the other hand, from our end as nurse leaders, we should also find way on how to make uh, activities creative, social interaction, physical dex dexterity is important, mobility of our people. And one way is an expression of our artistic skills. And we have the wall of shining wings. This is done by our, this is a, one of the winning uh, 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 Piece from our neonatal intensive care unit, and we had several, uh, and we they were awarded yesterday. And we also did some assessment as far as the psychosocial status is concerned. We had a lot. Uh, we had around 430 respondents who were assessed, and from their assessment, we came out with a program. We called we called it as PETS or the psychosocial enriching team support system. In the support system, we have the virtual circle. In the virtual circle, we invited random respondents from different units, so we, they did pick up. They have to pick picture and try to explain and relate 
what uh, are the things that they have experienced and how will they relate it to the picture. We have the ritual. The ritual is about the video clips when they are allowed also to process, uh, process what they have experienced to, to the video clip. And they will now be processed by Donna and Marsha. So this has been done continuously from August up until now. Number three is we have to recreate the dynamics in conducting meetings. We don't have to add pressure. We don't have to point fingers. We don't have to blame people. We just have to listen and make it light for them. And in making light, light things for them, we have to show also the evaluation of our customers. And we have to uh, always remind, let's, not, let's do away with numbers and let's just show happy faces and how we can respond to the needs of our our customers. And we have to collaborate more, especially not only within our, our, our division, but also with other divisions as well, especially the doctors, the paramedical uh, uh, staff, and, and, and many others who are involved in, in, in patient care. And number four, we have to entrust confidence to our people. We have to discover talents. We should not stop pushing for education, enhancing, nurturing them. It doesn't mean that we have the crisis, we will stop with all our programs. That's why uh, this was, again, this was prior to pandemic when we continuously uh, connect and reconnect with our partners locally and internationally. We have to capacitate, uh, continue capacitating and expanding the initiatives towards evidence-based practices. And our partner right now, especially is uh, Med Mercy Medical Center in Baltimore, is actively coordinating with us. They, they provided us with a lot of lectures in, in, in evidence-based practice, in even in sharing to us the, the practices on creating a culture of nurse retention, especially during these times. Also, sooner, I think by March, Dr. Mo Monica will be coming and she will also share to us her experiences in, in the nurse residency program. And of course, we are not losing our sight with the students. This is the star program for the students. We have to prepare them as well. And the dream are the nurses who are waiting for them because we need them. We have to prepare them as early as we can so that they will have a very good mindset when they start working. And of course, it was synergized in a framework like this, and we continuously collaborate. Of course, the club were there. And we are very much engaged in leveraging our educational advancements and development. We have our leadership track. We have our clinical track in order for them to be informed properly. We continuously provide our nursing hour and also enhancing and escalating our professional uh, the professional preparations of our officers. And we, we did not stop because we created a lot of modules related to the pandemic and we have uh, provided all of them with all the necessary information based from the modules created. We have tested the modules and we have created a virtual module and they were even invited in Cebu. Remember when Cebu escalated the number of cases and they knew that we have started a lot of modules in COVID-19 they invited and then they were very appreciative, very happy about the things that we shared with them. And of course, all the things that we have started, we are going to uh, present what the, the knowledge that we have created from the so psychosocial assessment and support of the healthcare workers during times of pandemic. So they will be presenting it this July in Singapore and another one by IFON, uh, East Asia Forum, I think this April. So we have to really share, that's our commitment and mission. Number five, we have to acknowledge their contribution. Provide recognition and awards, promotional opportunities should always be there. That is why we still continue our VIP program for our deserving nurses, very inspiring. In, in, in the nursing directorate. So we continuously engage with them, listen to them. And of course, our heroes, especially those who are assigned in COVID, we have heroes of the man. And we also share the same gratitude and love. We always say thank you to them. We, we share it to our intranet and in our e-newsletter, the, the, our, our, our living assets in the, in, in the company.
and this was prior to COVID. We still engage in numerous awards and 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 a lot of competitions locally and internationally, and. We even participated in Doha, no, in Hamad. This was a contest, and I think this was, this was an initiative of uh, IHI or the Institute of Healthcare Improvement. Though uh, we were granted, but the the sad part this happened uh, during during the initial stage of pandemic. But a lot of awards we received, including the Battle of Molecules. Number seven, we have to play around our head and heart. Oftentimes, leaders would only work with their head without considering that when you think, you have to listen as well. According to George Michael, you will never find peace of mind until you listen to your heart. And listening is about active listening. It allows us to understand where our people are coming from. That's why we have to practice open-ended questions. We have to clarify. We have to be attentive. We have to nod. We have to summarize, paraphrase, reflect feelings, and attune our feelings and ask more probing questions. And in, in, in this manner, we just had our CARES assembly. In our CARES assembly, we do collaborative assembly of, of our nurses in 2019, the synergy was just face-to-face, -face, but it did not stop us from pushing with this activity because they need to be informed, they need to listen and learn, they need to be involved, and they need to express and interact with us, the nurse leaders. That's why even if we cannot do it face-to-face, -face, we did it virtually. And of course, we have this, this, this mantra right now, that we, in order for us to keep our patients safe, we have to keep our workers safe as well. That's why we recreated our policies and strategies, and now it becomes a synergy of health workers safety and patient safety. We do our safety handle, interdisciplinary collaboration. We redesigned our protocols, improved and implement it. And mind you, we were at peak as far as COVID uh, uh, infected health uh, workers, we were at peak in April, July, and August, and where we were able to zero it, it in November, and we just had like six in December and one only in in in, uh, in uh, January because we kept on on really ensuring the safety of our workers. Number nine, we need to have full control of our moods and emotions. It is not the time for us to react and overreact. There should be no bullying in the workplace. There should be no disruptive behavior. We should not blame people and always practice just culture. To end with my remaining uh, slides, the key takeaways, let me just reiterate Henry Ford, there is no happiness except the realization that we have accomplished something. It's not all about accomplishing things. We can start joy to know how to do something well is to enjoy it even during the start of our work. There can be no joy in living without joy in working. That's from Thomas Aquinas. In an ordinary coffee bake, which coffee are you going to pick up? Of course, those with brands, those with coffee blends. You have to consider the quality of the coffee blends. Imagine image, aroma, strength, lavishness, bitterness. But on top of everything, we disregarded the ordinary coffee. What if we don't consider choosing and just find the meaning of coffee as life? It can change everything because this time we'll be enjoying life more than enjoying the lavishness of the coffee, the price of the coffee, the brand of the coffee, because we will be enjoying life with the people around us, sharing laughter, appreciating each one, in discovering talents. And the point here, the main point is we can enjoy life and work beyond the toxicity, beyond the business, beyond the pressure and anxiety, and just look at work as valuable to us and valuable to our beloved organization. And according to Gorky, when we work, uh, when work is a pleasure, life is a joy. When work is a duty, life is, a, is slavery. Few takeaways, work is not always thought as joyful, but you can always find value and joy in your work. 
Have full control of your moods and emotions. Avoid blaming people and start looking at the system failure. Overcome your fear and stress. Recreate your dynamics of conducting activities and always appreciate your people and their contributions. So these are my references. Thank you very much for listening. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Creating joy at work amidst busy schedules could even be possible. Well, of course, Dr. Borromeo mentioned to us regarding resiliency. Resiliency means being able to adapt, become flexible, and able to withstand pressures despite challenges. Well, thank you, Dr. Borromeo, for that wonderful lecture. Well, I just would like to ask our participants right now who are tuning live via Facebook of Philippine Women's University, have you ever encountered a situation where you have to go to work, but it feels like it's a burdensome? It's a burden. Have you ever yeah. experienced it one? If you have experienced yeah. it one, type in your comment, and we will be reading that later on, how, how you overcome your challenges or stresses. Well, Dr. Borromeo, it was a really interesting topic, but I have a personal question. You may answer this one or not, okay? So, sure. Doctor, based on your experience, have you ever experienced burned out, and how did you overcome that kind of situation? Well, it has always been part of my life, ever okay. since I started It's my your career. middle name. Yeah, <laughs> it's, okay. my middle name. it's in my system. It's right. in my blood, actually. When mm -hmm. I started working, even the start when I was still a staff and until I reached the highest position in, in, okay. in, in the directorate, I really, uh, I experienced in, in, in numerous occasions, in numerous fashion. Mm -hmm. But then again, you should always remind yourself, though it's dragging when you're very tired already, but balance of life, balance of, of, of your physical activities and, 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 mm -hmm. and work should be there. It's okay. not always accepting all the responsibilities. It's also about you physically, how you maintain your, your, your physical self. You have to exercise, you have to balance your diet. And, and okay. one way you have to accept that you are a valuable asset of the institution more mm -hmm. than just working. Well, pressures, failures are there, but if you don't be, you, you just uh, be uh, uh, confined within within all those failures, you will not be able to to, to stand up and, and face the, the challenges ahead. I mean, it's really dragging when you are tired already, but yes. when you mm -hmm. balance your life and find joy and meaning to your mission, because your work is a mission. This, mm -hmm. was, this was given to you by the Lord and you just have to accept your mission and appreciate the things, even how small they are and, and, and your contributions from how small and, and big the contribution is, you have to always appreciate and the people around you. You have to always connect and establish good uh, uh, relational leadership. And you find joys from those things. <laughs> I, yes. I found joy, yeah, yeah. joy from those things. Okay, thank you. So you have mentioned a while ago that if nurses feel burdened of their work, you mentioned that they need to know and go back to their core purpose of being Correct. a nurse, yeah. right? Correct. Okay. Correct. So there is a question here, doctor, regarding your per perspective on revisiting and updating baccalaureate nursing curriculums so that nurses become more ready in becoming facilitators of cultures of total wellness for the nursing workforce. What is your perspective on this? Yeah, just recently we have launched a program. We call it this, the star and the dream, like what I mm -hmm. uh, yeah, actually yeah. Uh, stated earlier. The star are the nurses. These are uh, student nurses. The connection of education to the industry, the healthcare industry is really very important. If we neglect, no, neglect the the uh, the the nurse, the nursing students who will be the future nurses mm -hmm. of the next generation, mm -hmm. we will also be neglecting their their uh, their uh, passion and appreciation to their future responsibility. 
So that's why after we, I, after really dealing with, with our partner in education, especially we have a nursing school, we actively collaborated with them. And start when I started joining the team of Manila Doctors, I started working and, and recreating strategies to work with them actively. Let's prepare our nurses. That's why we created several, several programs and modules waiting for our nurses. And considering that the nurse licensure examination will be expected this coming May, so we have already anticipated it. If in case they lack the necessary clinical skills, Manila doctors is ready to accommodate them and there will be already modules exclusively and customized for our students from whatever discipline they would want to have. So this thing has already been implemented just recently and our expert nurses in the field are ready to, 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 to uh, welcome them and prepare them. I know it is very hard at this point in time to expose them, though the president has, has uh, ac accepted and signed the face-to-face, -face, but still, uh, this thing is a challenge for us. But we don't stop. We continuously educate them, even virtually. But then again, it is not enough for them to have the virtual classroom but we have to still engage them once they have finished we the modules are there waiting for them okay well thank you so much dr borromeo for for that answer and, and sharing your experience with us so i'm really happy when you when you quoted one of the quotes there that we need to think in a global perspective because after all it is work well, thank you so much for all of our speakers. And that was the last question for Dr. Rodolfo Borromeo. Thank you very much, Doctor. My pleasure, my pleasure. Okay, so I hope that we learned something from this activity because at this point, let me welcome the Dean of the Philippine Women's University School of Nursing, Dr. Minerva Diala and the faculty in charge current trends and issues in nursing subject, Dr. Mark Dimon Santos, to award the certificates and tokens of appreciation to all of our speakers. I would like to request Dr. Diala to award the certificates and tokens to Dr. Palaganas and Dr. Barcelo, while Dr. Mark Santos for Mish Norman and Dr. Borromeo. I thank you for being. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. May the Philippine Women's University, the School of Nursing, hereby award the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Elenda Castro Palaganas for sharing her valuable knowledge as the resource speaker during the conduct of webinar entitled Nursing Today, Transition and Trends given this 20th day of February, 2021, to the Philippines, we, Philippine Women's University in Manila, Philippines. Signed, Mr. Arce Amparo, the overall chair, chairman for this webinar event, and yours truly, Dr. Minerva de Alla. Dr. Palaganas, congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For the Philippine Women's University, the School of Nursing, hereby award the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Teresita Erigo Barcelo for sharing her valuable knowledge as the resource speaker during the conduct of webinar entitled Nursing Today, Transition and Death, given this 20th day of February 2021 at the Philippine Women's University, Malating, Manila, signed Mr. R.C. Amparo, the overall chairman of this webinar event, and yours truly, Dr. Minerva Diala. Thank you very much. Hello. Yes, thank you very much. Much appreciated for thank you. Thank you.
Well, at this point in time, let us welcome Dr. Mark Dimon Santos to give the tokens and appreciations to Ms. Norman and Dr. Borromeo. Well, I just would like to remind everyone that you will receive your e-certificates after you evaluate the activity. Please remember that you need to register in order for you to receive your e-certificates. Thank you. As of this moment, let us now welcome Dr. Mark Dimon Santos. Mark, you need to put on your phone. Graduate School of Nursing awards the Certificate of Appreciation to Professor Rodolfo Borromeo for sharing his valuable knowledge as a resource speaker during the conduct of this webinar entitled Nursing Today, Transitions and Trends, given this 20th day of February 2021 at the, end, at the Philippine Women's University, Manila, Philippines, Signed, Arce Amparo and Dean Minerva at the island. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, of course, thank you so much to all our renowned speakers. May I present the uh, certificate to uh, Ms. Dina, a Philippine Women's University Graduate School of Nursing, awards their Certificate of Appreciation to Ms. Dina smith Nerman for sharing her valuable knowledge as a resource uh, speaker during this conduct of webinar entitled Nursing Today, Transitions and Trends, given this 20th day of February 2021 at the Philippine Women's University, Manila, Philippines. Signed, Arce Amparo and Dean Minerva de Alla. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right. So we actually learned something from this activity. It's so overwhelming that uh, there are a lot of learnings that we need to learn throughout life. We have learned about the current trends and challenges with nursing research and evidence-based practice. Also, we have been discussed about the shifts in the nursing education, how nursing adapts to the current educational pedagogy. And of course, we also looked into the various roles nurses play and how to create burdens into joy. Okay, so we have come into the point where we all need to say goodbyes. But goodbyes are more precious if you have learned and gained something during the process. The learnings that shall never be taken away from us, even goodbyes. But before we close this webinar, I would like you to look on the people who in one way or the other have contributed to the success of this webinar. Let's watch this video.
And that was it. It was really heartwarming to see that kind of video. To formally close this activity, let me introduce to you the Nurse Cancer Programs of Health, Primary Healthcare Corporation and the co-chairman of the organizing committee. I am proud to present to you Ms. Queen Jebeline Yanga Abdallah. Mr. Marco Alfredo Benitez, the University President, Dr. Felina Young, Chancellor, Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Minerva Diala, Dean School of Nursing, our distinguished and esteemed resource speakers, Dr. Erlinda Palaganas, Dr. Teresita Barcelo, Ms. Dina Schnurman, and Dr. Rodolfo Borromeo. Faculty members, students, friends and colleagues, a pleasant day to all. The nursing profession incessantly evolving and progresses at an incredible pace. The current trends in nursing are multifaceted, as nursing is in the midst of groundbreaking changes in research, education, practice, and administration. In the fight against the pandemic, nurses took the center stage as frontliners. These changes have drastically transformed the profession today and will likely to affect the future. This webinar has taken a critical look in the transitions and current trends in nursing and healthcare as a whole. This is the golden time that the roles and the contributions of the nurses are highlighted and recognized. My immense appreciation to the resource speakers for their precious time and for rendering a substantial talk and for successfully fulfilling today's webinar objectives. In order to survive the changes in the modern nursing world, let me add some words from Timothy Porter O'Grady, and he said, our work isn't changing. Change is our work. If you look at changes like that, it would never be an enemy. In a nutshell, it is being open to changes and seeing opportunities instead of challenges. Before I end this talk, I would like to commend and thank the PhD in nursing, both in Qatar and Kuwait students, for taking the extra mile in making this event a success. Spearheaded by the chairperson, Mr. Arce Amparo, to the webinar working committee and chairpersons, to the Philippine Women's University Graduate School for this opportunity, as well as the ICT and the multimedia staff for their unwavering support all throughout this undertaking. Once again, thank you very much for spending your time with us. Be safe, everyone, and God bless. Queen. Okay, so I uh, would like to thank everyone, but we would like to remind as well that the evaluation link has been sent to your emails. You may also look on your screen right now. I don't know if you can see that one. It's here or there, but it is flashed on the screen. You may also want to check on the Facebook live streaming comment page because the evaluation link is also posted there. So once again, before we end, I would like to reiterate what Dr. Castro Palaganas quoted regarding Li Wongji, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not familiar, World Heart Organization Director General 2015. Actions without knowledge is a waste of effort. Well, knowledge without actions is a waste of resource. On behalf of the organizing committee and our professor, Dr. Mark Dimon Santos, I would like to inform you that I'm Pichas Loyal, your webinar moderator, and this has been Nursing Today transitions and trends. As we end, let us all join in the singing of the Philippine Women's University hymn. See you next time, and God bless.